Good morning. Good morning. It's Tuesday, April 9th. I can't believe we're like steaming right through the beginning of April. It's wild. We have lots to cover in the Rust case today from the court's order in the Hannah Gutierrez case to the state strikes back in Baldwin's case. Lots and lots to cover. So as always, replay crew, love you. Everything is timestamped down below so you can get to the bits and pieces that you are most interested in. But the prosecution here filed over 300 pages in response to Baldwin's attorneys who filed over 300 pages. So it's going to be a very busy day breaking down the Rust case. I will do a brief road so far of where we're at with this particular motion because like a lot has happened in the world of law since the last time we covered Rust, which was just like last week and it's wild. So today there is a hearing in um, one of the cases that I've been covering. So just a preview of the week. If you have the Lawnard app, you know this. So if you have the Lawnard app, you're gonna you're gonna be in the loop with everything. But if you don't have the Lawnard app, you should probably get it in your app store or at lawnardapp.com. The podcast this week is going to be covering the newest stuff going on with Diddy because his son has been sued. He's been sued again. There is a hearing in the federal case with Little Rod this morning. So there's a lot happening in that world of cases. Plus, the court has sent the plaintiff's lawyer in other cases to the disciplinary committee. So there's so much happening in the Diddy cases that I couldn't let it go another like three weeks or we would never catch back up. I feel like we would get rolled over. So we are covering the lawsuit against Diddy's son, Sean Combs, and the action that the federal court has taken against uh, or will be taking against the plaintiff's lawyer and the little rod and the latest case. Um, we'll be taking all those things up and going through um, going through what the court said there in the podcast tomorrow. Also for tomorrow, we have a members only live stream. I had to bump the members only live stream back a little bit time wise because I have honestly just maybe too much information, but real life. I have canceled my dental cleaning multiple times because like trials will pop off. And then I'm like, I'm so sorry. When I planned this eight months ago, I didn't realize I would be covering trial. And um, my husband is like, I swear to you, if you do not go and get your teeth cleaned, because dentist, I'm like, I floss and I water pick and I do all the things. He's like, you cannot miss another dental cleaning. So I needed to bump the members only live back a little bit. That works out well, because tomorrow we have the podcast premiere. And then we're going to have a members only live later in the afternoon. And then that members only live is going to roll right into court coverage because we're going to Idaho tomorrow evening. Bring a drink. Courts at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So <laughs> we're at 6 p.m. Central Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, something, something UTC. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But um something, something UTC. So I'm sure you can Google uh, 4 p.m. Pacific time in UTC and get an answer. Uh, so we will be going to court in the evening. I will probably be bringing some whiskey. <laughs> That's just the way it's going to be. So we're going to roll from our members only live stream right into live court in the afternoon. So that's, or in the evening, that's our plan for tomorrow. Um, it's going to be busy. Oh, I don't want to chew ice into the microphone, but ice, ice baby has uh, escaped my coffee and come galloping into my mouth. So what we're going to do tomorrow is a full, full day, but the podcast is like Diddy part two um, because Diddy's son was sued and all of that like dropped on Friday. This motion dropped on Friday. <sighs> there, I just, I, there's so many like housewives civil lawsuits I would like to get to. And the the criminal stuff is just just full steam ahead right now. Um, but okay, the shirt is Grogu. I saw a number of you ask. The shirt is Grogu. It is it is Star Wars. For those of you that saw my photos on Instagram yesterday of the eclipse, the way that the Lawnards clocked the music I put with that Instagram post immediately, it made me feel so seen and so loved and so appreciated. And I was like, ah, oh, ah, oh, y'all get it. 
Um, so for those of you asking about Scientology, Goosebump Scientology got bumped back a week, but I promise you there will be um, Scientology stuff that is happening that I'm covering. Are you covering the new VPR lawsuit? Uh, Faith's lawsuit is on my docket. I have not had a chance to pull it up yet. What we are bumping up against is, um, is that we have the Karen Reed trial getting ready to start next week. And so balancing the time that it takes to prep and do um, podcast plus live stream plus the cases, the taking on a new case is going to take a minute depending on what the rest of it is. So yes. Um, and I see you talking about Dr. B. So Dr. Dr. B, I never had Dr. B do my dental cleanings. I'm going to give you a little bit of a secret. Um, this is this is my own this is my own opinion. It's a secret. This is inside baseball. Dentists do a lot of great things. Most dentists do not regularly do dental cleanings. Um, I find that they're not as good as it. They're not as good at it. Hygienists do dental cleaning so regularly. They're just great. But um, the Dr. B, um, that is not his uh, skill set. I would never have him. I would. I never want anyone else to do a filling on my teeth uh, or anything. But um, hygienists do. They they have a a a very very good hand for cleanings because it, it's what they do all the time so find you a dental hygienist that you love let your dentist do your fillings and your x-rays and whatever um everybody's got their own skill sets but most dentists um are not great with the cleanings and um i told dr b that to his face i'm like i let him do a cleaning once and i was like never never again and it was just because i was in law school and didn't have time <laughs> to go during normal hours and i was like you could just do it and then he was like mm -mm, nope nope you're this is this is definitely not your skill set. Um, so uh, dental hygienists are, are where it's at for cleaning, but that has to happen tomorrow or I will, um, or I will not get in for like another eight months and then I will feel, uh, gross. And I also need to bleed for Like there are things I need to do. Look, I got on the treadmill yesterday. Like we're, we're, we're baby stepping. Life is kind of chaos over here at the end of the school year. Um, we had tons of band this weekend to the Lawnards I saw at Winter Guard this weekend. Thank you for saying hi. It was lovely to see you. Um, and thank you. It was just, it was nice to see people in, in person, Dr. B this life and then we'll roll the intro, but Dr. B had gotten his shingle shot cause we're adults now and things, um, things are delightful, but Dr. B anticipated that like it would all be fine. <laughs> So on Saturday, when we were supposed to go to the Winter Guard finals, Dr. B was a uh, a, a, a disaster, just a disaster. He just was laid out, um, which is not uncommon with the shingles vaccine. He just hadn't really thought about it. And I think they downplayed that when people get side effects from the, uh, from the shingles vaccine, it knocks them out for a couple days generally. And... <laughs> He was not aware. So I went to Kentucky by myself to go see finals. It was always good. It's always good to run into the law nerds, um, even when I feel awkward and I'm just like, hi, <laughs> by myself. But also I love the other parents on my son's guard. So it was really fun to see them. And um, I don't mind a car ride by myself um, singing, well, this trip, the offspring on the way up and show tunes on the way back. It's, you know, balance. So they did great they got their highest uh score of the year my kids uh final solo toss of the performance was a stunning seven on his rifle but he also had a great um a great like 45 uh lasso toss with a roll under it it was just hmm, it was just fantastic so i was so excited to see him uh stephanie i was literally there for like two hours um <laughs> i was literally there for like two hours to see winter guard finals in bowling green and then i was i was back out here's the thing about traveling with your kid for winter guard is that my kid does not have his driver's license yet because he has not prioritized having his driver's license and i love driving with him and we get to chat but also um when the bus leaves if i don't leave i can't get back from kentucky to school in time to pick him up from school when the buses are done unloading because i wanted to stop and get snackies so um because any drive over an hour needs snackies so i uh i was hustling uh 
back from back from um Kentucky to pick kiddo up at school but they had their highest score of the year they uh did not place as well as they would have liked to but here's the thing about the um the creative arts that I keep reminding everyone that is true is that all you can do is literally with creative arts all you can do is your best like all you can do is your best and everything else just falls as it may. And it is an interesting lesson to learn as a teen. I played a combat sport. So in a combat sport, you can look at a scoreboard and look at how much time is left and start figuring out what you're going to do or not. So you have, you have some touch point for what you can do. With the creative arts, it is literally a, we can only do our best. And they had their cleanest run, they had their best run they had their highest score so even if you don't win it's kind of just literally you did your best run of the year i don't know what else you can ask for that's all you can ask for and it looked fantastic so if any of you watch guard or band there especially with rifles there is this really satisfying like thwack when they catch especially the larger tosses and every single toss they had a completely clean run nothing got dropped every single toss you heard that crispy thwack when they caught their rifles and i like i got chills i was like it was so good so as a mom there's not much else i can um say about that travis is still going through dci tryouts so our life is a little bit in chaos but um for those i saw the question does your son do saber as well no nope he uh he does he does not love saber he loves rifles if if he could just do all the rifles he would do all of the rifles um so dax is a name i was in marching band the color guard always had my respect they risk concussions when they toss those rifles my kid absolutely loves it um daniel i will let well i will decide with the do with dr b and t um if he wants me to share that information i trust the law nerds it's it's the rest of the internet that worries me so i will keep you posted on that uh depending on t's comfort level uh so i will keep you posted on that depending on t's comfort level dci is in drum and bugle corps yes so yes um anyway he loves it <laughs> carla said it's hard to get scheduled with a great hygienist yeah it's it's like a six month out and if you fall off the rotation it takes a little it takes a little bit so i will keep you guys um i will keep you guys posted on all of the things it's been uh it's like the the this season of school is busy for both kids and then we've got the karen reed trial coming up next week we've got prep for the baldwin trial there's a bunch of stuff coming up in may so i um i am trying to balance everything that's coming up family and making sure that the podcast keeps rolling and making sure that i actually um sleep on occasion so that's where we're at i've seen a lot of comments in the comment section that it's like are you covering this trust me law nerds i always know it's out of a emily i would love you to commentate on everything in the world I would love to commentate on everything in the world trust if i could just live stream me watching vpr and give you commentary on it i absolutely would but hours in the day so i have had to pick and choose and when we're looking at um when we're looking at picking and choosing i am very interested to go into the karen reed trial as a juror i very much want to see what is happening there silently me said question do you have any videos on karen reed so far no i will have an overview of the case the week trial starts so that should be next week's podcast unless something happens so i will do a, a an overview like this is the this is what this trial is generally about but i'm going into the karen reed trial as a juror because there is so much happening in the stratosphere of that case I am not getting into everything going on outside of court. There are channels that have done it. I'm sure there are plenty of channels that do it well. I am going to stick to, this is the case we expect to see in trial. This is the controversy of that case that we expect to see in trial and cover it from there. Karen Reed's defense attorney is someone I had worked with at the LA County District Attorney's Office. He's a former DA, he prosecuted Phil Spector, but he was also one of Weinstein's defense attorneys. I haven't seen him in trial in a real long time, 
Uh, so I'm real interested, real interested to see how that goes. Fun fact, we'll get into this later, but fun fact, um, he was also the attorney that represented briefly and was giving statements to the media for the federal judge that was Tom Girardi's mistress. Like if you wanna talk about like the weird little interconnectedness of the world of law, that was one of those things I was like, oop. So for those of you that don't know what the case is about, real brief, prosecutors allege that she ran over her boyfriend who was a law enforcement officer and left him to die. Um, her team is arguing that this is all a cover up, that the things, the injuries on the victim don't even match what they're saying happened, that there is evidence that went missing, all the things. So it is a case with a lot of questions. She is facing murder charges. She is out of custody. It is an odd case out of Massachusetts. There are a lot of questions. It is not, um, when we covered Daryl Brooks, the Daryl Brooks case wasn't a question really of did he do it? It was a question of he's representing himself, he's never gonna plea and they have to prove this case. That was never, the issue was never did Daryl Brooks do this thing of yes, he did. The the Taylor business case was not a did you do it? It was a, is there a insanity defense here or not? The Murdoch case was much more of a, so what is the evidence on this case? Like, what is the timeline? What is the forensic evidence? Much more of a interesting um, question of what is being proven to the jury? What is the evidence here? We went into it, I think, knowing um, quite a lot about the financial crimes and being the pretty um, confident, I think, on the financial crimes like it was pretty clear some of them he had already admitted it was very clear that the financial crimes had happened but on the murder murder case it was what is the evidence here let's see it unfold let's see if these are which attorney convinces me in opening and who delivers on their promises remember poot got into opening in murder and was like we're not just going to show you that the state didn't prove their case we're going to prove to you that he didn't do it poot sir sir Sir, where though? Where did you deliver on that promise, Poot? Where though? In the Karen Reed trial, we're going in with a lot of, um, something happened to this victim. I, ju I just have a lot of questions if it's what the state says happened. And in a brief overview of the case, when I have that many questions, I'm like, we're going in as a jury. I'm putting the, I'm putting it down. We didn't start it at the beginning. I'm putting it down. We're going in as a jury. Lawyers, explain to me what the fuck has happened here. And so that starts next week in Massachusetts. Um, and we are going to see for ourselves what happens in that case. But it, there is, there are a lot of questions going in truly a lot of questions going in and i think those who know the case better i mean people have very strong feelings about this case um the community has very strong feelings about this case in massachusetts i want to see if the lawyers can explain to us what happened and i want to understand how the jury gets to their decision whenever they get to a decision without me knowing what's going on in the stratosphere of the case and then we will go back and cover the stratosphere of the case afterwards so, um, we're just going to watch it as a jury. That's, that's the decision I made on that. I know there are other trials going on, including, um, there's the Apple River case. I think that a lawyer, you know, is doing breakdowns of that. I know that Chad Daybell is getting ready to go to trial. I am not, um, covering the Daybell case. I think those of you that are familiar with the case know why it is kid victims. It is very sad. It is, uh, a heavy case, I'm not covering it. And the other cases that are going on at the time, I just don't have bandwidth because I'm really interested to see what's happening in the Karen Reed case. And that is where my, um, that is where my attention is. Like, I really wanna know what's happening there. So I'm following, that's, that's what I'm following right now. And we will, we will do that. I saw a comment in the chat from longtime friend of the chat, Matt, the future ESQ. Hey guys, I'm engaged, Matt. First of all, I'm sorry I don't have wedding bells. Congratulations. Um, that is so exciting. Chat, law nerds, let's congratulate Matt. While I roll the intro, 
I realize I've been talking for like 20 minutes. <laughs> Let's congratulate Matt Well, we roll the intro. Law nerds, congratulations to Matt. Matt, congratulations to you and your fiance. <sighs> Law nerds, um, 20 minutes in it. I mean, at some point we should start the stream officially, right? Let's do that now. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not <laughs> Let's get into it. Law nerds, we're going to be going to New Mexico for the day. That's my file that's not at all what i meant to do we're going to be going to new mexico for the day um we're going to cover the latest order in the gutierrez case that we watched the hearing and saw what the court denied we're going to go through this a little bit more um thoroughly i also know there are sentencings going on right now i know that alita over on legal bites is co uh, is covering that so if you guys are interested in popping back and forth i am never offended the replay crew is always here for you, but I know you guys like being in the chat with the law nerds and I get it, but I am never offended. It is, there is lots happening. So don't feel um, obligated. We always leave up the streams. I always timestamp them down below for the replay crew so that you guys can pop in and out as you want. So with all of that, we are going to cover um, the things going on in New Mexico. I will say for the members only live stream tomorrow, members, I need to tell you a story about why having a teen on social media is terrifying in a hilarious way with regard to um, Travis, because I don't want to forget to tell you that story. We're also going to do a little bit of a EDB commentary on early EDB YouTube videos that some of you saw when they were on the channel when I used to cover tech. Some of you have not, so we're going to do a little bit of commentary on that. And then we're going to do another uh, another little quick bit of what are we watching, where I take a look at the channel and tell you what we're watching. I also have some inside baseball YouTube stuff to talk to you guys about that I'm excited about. So we're going to do all of that. So Matt, congratulations. Um, Sorchata, I, Sorchota, I am not going to do that well. And congratulations to Alita and Baby Bites. Alita announced her pregnancy over on her channel uh, over the weekend. So if you guys have not popped into that post and you are um, you want to go and, and offer well wishes, I can't imagine um, how difficult it might be to go through that on the channel, like on the internet, because it was it was just so far away for, for me. Like I have, I'm navigating teens and memes on the internet, but um, navigating a pregnancy on the internet is something I would not do well. So um, huge congratulations to Alita and Baby Bites. I'm really excited for her. I'm excited for her and her husband. It's a very exciting time. Navigating it online would be hard. Amy said, Emily just guilted me into calling to schedule my overdue cleaning. Amy, I'm just going to offer a refrain. I encouraged you to take care of your shit at the same time. I'm taking care of shit. So, Lonards, I'm I'm your ADHD body double. I'm here to remind you when you need to do things. Because um, I forget. <laughs> I forget as well. So, with all of that... Um, I will be getting into, let's see, the order in the Hannah Gutierrez Reed case. Let's do a quick road so far. Uh, Miguelina, I don't think we need to clip this because we've already covered the the ruling. I just want to see if the court has anything sassy to say, honestly. Um, so Debbie Joe said, not so much a baby bite as it is a wee nibble. <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, little white lie. Now's a good time. We've got a couple hours. Just make a list right now. You don't have to make all the phone calls right now. The making of the phone calls is honestly the hardest part. And there are times I asked Dr. B to just, I'm like, I need you to make the phone calls or Chris, who is one of my oldest and dearest friends, who is also my right hand. People are like, what is Chris's job? I'm like, uh, this is a phrase that was coined by a friend years ago, but I'm like, she's the CEO. She's the chief Emily officer. She has to make sure that I like get stuff done and um, don't forget to make nail appointments because then I'll have a complete 
social anxiety panic attack that I have not made said nail appointment before an event or remembered to go get my hair cut or whatever. So she has to wrangle all of the Emily, but she's been doing that for most of our life. So it's fantastic. All right. What were we talking about? Oh, Hannah Gutierrez. Who can we just talk about next week? I need to put this in the app, Lonards. Let's just I'm gonna sidebar for a second. It's gonna be that kind of day. Next week, next fucking week, Monday is the Hannah Gutierrez sentencing, which means I need, wait, why do I have an ortho appointment? <gasps> okay, we'll be done before sentencing. <laughs> next week is the Hannah Gutierrez read sentencing. I, my ortho appointment is long overdue to finish out my Invisalign. It's a whole separate story. We have to close gaps of teeth. Hannah Gutierrez is getting sentenced on Monday, so I'll need to record the podcast early. That'll probably get done on Saturday or Sunday. Tuesday, Karen Reed starts trial with jury selection. No streaming during jury selection. Tuesday. Tuesday. There is a motion hearing in the TikTok psychic case. <laughs> So I am going to attend the motion hearing in the TikTok psychic case, which cannot be streamed, rebroadcast, restreamed, recreated. But you guys know I take the most amazing notes. So I am going to do the motion hearing in the TikTok psychic case, and then I am going to cover the motion hearing for you. We're going to catch up on what the latest filings say, and then I'm going to go through what the court said and did. I'm going to go through what the TikTok psychic has said in uh, in that hearing, because the last hearing, there was a moment, there was a moment when the court asked her a question, because again, she is representing herself, and she literally said without a second thought or a hint of irony, I didn't see that question coming. I've never been so glad that I'm automatically muted in a hearing in my life. So Tuesday, Karen Reed starts jury selection. TikTok psychic case has a hearing. Wednesday, new episode of the podcast, as always. And the alibi filings have to be filed in the Koberger case. The court did not bump out that deadline yet. Thursday, I think we may be into gavel to gavel trial coverage if Reed picks a jury in two days, if Reed takes a little bit longer, we will we will swoop swoop through the rest of the things that we have to cover. That is next week. That is next week. It is busy. It is a busy week. So I'm going to try to swoop swoop as much as I can today. Um, let just fingers crossed. I swear, if Diddy gets like arrested and indicted, it is going to uh, just throw the entire calendar into chaos. So Feds, look. Um, early early mid may can we just early mid may early mid may cuz we can't uh we're booked and busy over here we have like band banquets and and uh, booked and busy other trials so that is the plan we will see how long Karen Reed trial uh, jury selection takes after we get through jury selection i'll let you know in the app and then May is going to disappear in a heartbeat. But if we cannot get, if we do not have a jury on the 18th, we will try to catch up on other cases. And maybe instead, of, well, we'll see. Thursday, we're going to try to plow through updates on the cases that we haven't updated yet that don't need a deep dive. We're going to go through as many cases as we can and do this is what's happening. Maybe a little food court. All right. With all of that, let's get back. Let's. You guys grab your grab your champagne glasses or your water depending on how you would like to hydrate Ugh. whiskey in a teacup is fine it's early some places and not other places we need to go to idaho um no we don't no we don't emily you can't use idaho and new mexico synonymously it's not gonna go well <laughs> Road so far. This is the court's order denying the defense emergency motion for a new trial or and release. The defense argued essentially, trust me, bro, this new case means she automatically gets a new trial dead ass. 
And then the state was like, I can't do my work if they don't do theirs. They didn't even, they didn't even make a motion, your honor. They just said, obviously we get a new trial. And the state argued that this is not what that case stands for. Remember, this is the case that was dealing with um, and or, and the underlying case, not Hannah's case, the underlying Supreme Court case was dealing, New Mexico Supreme Court, the underlying New Mexico Supreme Court case was dealing with four different things, all connected by and or. And if the jury picked some of those combinations, they could in theory convict on things that weren't illegal. And that is a result that cannot stand. You cannot convict people of lawful activity in a lawful way. So that was the uh, defense argument, state argument. We watched the hearing, the court denied it and said, I will give a more thorough ruling. We have now reached the point of more thorough ruling. So comes now the court. Um, procedural and factual summary. The court summarized events pertinent to the resolution of the emergency motion. We went through it all, but I think the laying out of the theories in the alternative theory is helpful. Count one, involuntary manslaughter. Um, involuntary manslaughter consists of manslaughter committed in the commission of an unlawful act, not amounting to a felony. That would have been the, um, the unlawful or negligent handling of a firearm misdemeanor. Alternative count one, involuntary manslaughter in the commission of a lawful act which might produce death in an unlawful manner or without due caution or circumscription. This is, you were doing something lawful, loading the gun, perhaps, on a movie set where you are the armorer. You are doing something lawfully, but you are doing it in a way that is negligent or reckless. That is the without due caution or circumscription. This is gonna come up in the Baldwin case. This is gonna come up in the arguments of the Baldwin case because the two alternate theories exist in both cases. We'll hear more about the state's theory in that case in a minute. Count two, tampering with evidence, and the jury yeeted that as they should have, shouldn't have been brought, didn't like it. Following months of robust motion practice on February 21st, the court and panel, a petite jury, just a wee jury, a trial jury, not a grand jury, a petite jury. Thereafter, the court presided over the jury trial between February 22nd and March 6th. I know, it was pretty quick, all things considered. You guys, we've got to build our stamina. Karen Reed is going to be five or six weeks, maybe a little bit more. Baldwin will probably be like 15 days-ish. But we're all working towards the four months we are going to spend together when Koberger goes to trial. Like Team Baker is already planning for it um, because we are going to be day-to-day -day in trial, month in and month out. It is going to be a lot. But I know for those of you that loved the six, seven weeks we were together for Debt v. Heard and the six weeks we were together for Murdaugh, you're like, three months, perfect. <laughs> Let's ride. Outside the presence of the jury, the court held jury instruction conferences on March 5th and March 6th. On both days, defense requested a jury instruction such that the court would instruct the jury that they must unanimously decide which act the defendant committed vis-a-vis -vis jury instructions on the inval. The state objected to the defense position. Ultimately, the court declined to provide the requested instructions after considering argument of counsel and proffered case law on jury unanimity. The jury does not have to be unanimous on theory on an involuntary manslaughter with two theories. That is what the case law says in New Mexico and other jurisdictions as well. Notably, defense did not object to the presence of any and or language in any proposed instruction during the conferences. That is a huge issue. If the defense attorney knew, and it seemed that the defense attorney did know, that that Supreme Court case was pending, there should have been a specific objection to the and or language to preserve it. The court considered it anyway. I think that's appropriate instead of the court... Um, yeeting the argument and saying you didn't preserve the objection. I think the court's noting the project, the objection is not specifically preserved, but the court's addressing it anyway. I think that's the, I think that's the proper, uh, the proper 
consideration. Not all courts would do that. Some courts would be like, not preserved, yeet. On March 6th, the court provided two primary instructions to the jury. We went over these in the hearing and we heard them in, in trial, 12 and 12A, which are the alternate theories. After receipt of these instructions and others, the jury deliberated. Thereafter, on March 6th, the jury returned to general verdicts. Yeah, I was picking my kid up from band. That jury was like, what we're not going to do is be here another second longer ever. They they just zoom, 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 freaking zoom. On March 15th, defendant filed her emergency motion. On March 29th, the court considered oral argument via Google Meet on the emergency motion. Defense counsel, Mr. Bowles, remotely appeared and argued on behalf of defendant who appeared remotely and in custody. Special Prosecutor Morrissey remotely appeared and argued on behalf of the state. After considering argument, the court denied the motion via verbal ruling, and this is the written ruling. The defendant's emergency motion asserts that the New Mexico Supreme Court recently issued decision in state versus Taylor necessitates a new trial due to purported jury instruction error in the instant action. Specifically, defendant explains the Taylor court criticized the use of and or in listing various acts the jury could find committed by the defendants. Indicta, indicta. The Taylor court also noted that such, by the way, dicta, Lonards, I we've had lots of um, conversation about what dicta is, but I think the best reference to dicta is it's like my opinion. It is the it is not the order of the court. It is not the ruling jurisprudence. It's like my opinion. Screamed in the voice of Tamra Judge. It's like my opinion. I need a stinger of that. I don't do it nearly as well as she did. Other Meredith Marks, I can do a little bit better. I can't do that scream. Either way, it's like my opinion. This was not part of the holding in this particular case. The Taylor court also noted that such drafting of the instructions could confuse the jury and lead to a non-unanimous verdict on any particular act. I think the court was signaling to the legislature and to lawyers, keep appealing these. We don't like the way that these jury instructions meet out. We don't like the way that they result. And we think that the jury instructions, the UGs, the uniform jury instructions should be changed and get rid of all of the and ors. Um, but that's a signal. That is a, it's like our opinion. That is not the holding because this case is much narrower than that. Um, let's see. Further, defendant argued, this is precisely the argument that Ms. Gutierrez Reed made in jury instruction arguments before this court. These arguments were overruled and the state made the same instructional error in this case using and or acts and allowing the jury to not be unanimous on one particular act. The defendant's arguments are not well taken. Mm. You're in danger, Mr. Bowles. The court, the court has called you out. <clears throat> Defendant's arguments are not well taken. I don't know if the court can say bullshit uh, in a ruling, but this is uh, this is kind of bullshit. This is the court saying that's actually not what happened. The court denies defendant's emergency motion for five primary reasons. Oh, they didn't just go with one. And again, I really was impressed with this judge in motion practice. I really liked the way this judge governed hearings. When we got to the trial, I was like, um, Your Honor, where are you? Like, where is the judge that showed up in the motion hearings, that shows up in the writing? We get to trial and the judge is like, children, I let you have coffee. How dare you behave this way? Don't make me take away your coffee. So good in motion practice. The court denies defendant's emergency motion for five reasons. First, State v. Taylor does not entirely prohibit trial courts from using and or conjunction in jury instructions. Mm -hmm. Further, the court could not find the and the defendant fails to cite anywhere in the jury instructions conference record where defendant expressly objected to the use of and or instructions. 
reminding the appellate court that may eventually take this up that this objection was not preserved. Second, the Taylor court ultimately reversed on the basis that the use of and or within the offending jury instruction in Taylor, that context specifically, allowed the jury to make a decision they were not allowed to make, meaning they could convict on something that was not unlawful. Oh, Emily, keep reading. Specifically, the, the jury in Taylor was allowed to return guilty verdicts solely based on one or more of defendants' alleged policy violations. It is enough to point out that the jury, as instructed, could have convicted defendants on the charged felony child abuse crimes for merely failing to object or merely failing to obtain agency permission to transport the children to and from a nearby park. That is not illegal. Violating a policy is not violating the law. This technical violation of the agency's policies could not support a standalone finding that defendants place the victims in any direct line of danger. Here, both conduct options are within the actus reus component of the elements instruction of jury instruction 12a. For all crimes, legally blonde fans, you know this, lawyers, paralegals, legal profession, and law nerds. A lot of you have already probably learned this. We're going to review it again. For there to be a crime, there have to be two things, a mens rea and an actus reus, the mind and the act. You have to do both. Now, of course, some crimes you don't, the mental state is just like doing the thing. So the act of the mental state can kind of merge. We're not going to get in to a long discussion of which crimes those are. But you have to have a mens rea and you have to have an actus reus. So mind's state of mind and the act. Um, the court is saying in Gutierrez, both options, A and B, or 12 and 12A, both have valid actus reus. So both are valid acts that you can find the crime um, of involuntary manslaughter. Specifically, the jury was to consider whether defendant loaded live ammunition into a firearm intended to contain only inert am ammunition and or Hannah Gutierrez failed to perform an adequate safety check of the ammunition she loaded into the firearm. I mean, like we're both. Jury instruction number 12A filed March 8th. In relation to the pertinent involuntary manslaughter charge, both of these conduct options described a potential lawful act which might produce death in an unlawful manner or without due caution or circumscription. Either way you get there, fine, fine. Either way you get there, fine, fine. <laughs> Imagine Elle Woods and EDB in the same court. Look, I, I really, every day, hope that one of these days I will in fact run into Reese Witherspoon around and about in this small little city called Nashville. One of these days it will happen. Look, there is an entire housing development that my husband and I drive by on occasion called Witherspoon and we can't drive. It is the bougiest. Well, there's a couple, but it is some of the bougiest shit I have ever seen. The mansions in Nashville, and this is true in areas where there is more land, California is a little bit different. There are mansions unlike anything I have ever seen. And when we drive by, my husband and I are like, oh, oh, it is with a spoon. Because it feels like in that community, when you go there and people are like, where do you live? Because unlike Southern California, that is not, or at least where I lived, housing, there were sections of like a community, but there weren't like housing communities here. The housing communities have like merch and stuff. So where you live generally relates to which development you live in. And that's different than moving from anyway, moving from Southern California. But whenever we drive by, we're like, if you are asked and you live there, you would have to say, <laughs> I live in Witherspoon because it feels like it has to be that way. So the Middle Tennessee area, which community you live in, is a big deal. Well, yes, they do have merch. I have definitely seen people wearing their merch. A lot of them also have golf courses. Um, 
It's an entire situation. People ask where I live and they're like, where? I'm like, exactly. Le leave it be. But we, uh, we live in the country. People are like, that's in like the, yes, yes, it is. So anyway, it is, uh, it is pretty funny. We're going to keep going. Um, Ray asked how many to go before 750 K subs. We're pretty close. We're well more than halfway there. So anyway, I keep hoping that one of these days we will just like run into Reese Witherspoon. She lives around and about middle Tennessee. I have, uh, people run into her. People run into lo like lots of celebs. They just kind of run around. So it is what it is. But anyway, <laughs> All right, let us continue on with this without talking about housing communities with merch. <laughs> They're like, um, I do. They should just be like, where are you from? Lawnard. I am from the fiefdom of Lawnard. I live in Lawnard, all the things in Lawnard. Um, Spooky said, just don't run into Morgan Whalen. Is it Whalen or Wallen? Um, yeah, hurling chairs from uh, the tops of bars is not... Uh, not, 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 I, not ideal. Like not, I, not ideal. Um, no, 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 no. Also, if you're going to hurl things off of roofs, um, and you almost hit cops, it's going to go badly, no matter who you are. So I'm sorry. I don't Wallen, Waylon, Waylon, Wallen. I, <sighs> The amount of time that I see the Morgan and the W and automatically think Morgan Wade first will show you how deeply impacted my brain is by Real Housewives. <laughs> Look, I would be stoked if I ran into Jelly Roll. Between Jelly Roll, Bunny uh, XO, and, and Reese Witherspoon, I've got a list of celebs that I would love to run into out and around uh, Tennessee. Either way, we're getting back to the Judge Snark. I'm sure there is more. The court goes on to say, thus, unlike the jury and Taylor, the jury in the instant action was not instructed with a legally impermissible uh, conduct component, which we knew. Third, the Taylor court did not overturn precedent establishing that where alternative th theories of guilt are put forward under a single charge, jury unanimity is required only as to the verdict not the particular theory of guilt. That's what we said multiple times. Mm -hmm. They talk about the Taylor court distinguishing uh, the Goody or Godoy decision. They talk about the jury instructions that were proper. They talk about the alternate theories. Again, the alternate theories are fine. They talk about other case law. Let's see. Here, two conduct options separated by and or were set forth in paragraph one of jury instruction 12A. Nonetheless, the options set forth in paragraphs one of both instruction 12 and 12A represent the same underlying criminally culpable conduct. Defendant's loading of lime ammunition into a firearm. Did she do it recklessly? Did she do it unlawfully? Was it negligent use of a firearm? All of it's kind of same, same time, right? Um... Carla, you, you've stopped my heart. I know he is in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I did run into Dave when he was here in Nashville. I almost couldn't say words. It was like, Dave, like Dave. Then again, I feel like, um, me and the members of the Dave Matthews band would have the most unhinged, um, delightful rambling ADHD nonlinear conversation of all time. I just, I think it would be fun uh, for all involved. And all of our kids are kind of in that same realm of age. Fascinating. I digress. Um, music is life. Here we go. The court says the jury instructions here are distinguishable from the other case law. And we knew that fifth, we're now to point five. The state's position conveyed in its closing argument over defense counsel's objection that the jury need not be unanimous as to which theory of guilt defendant committed as long as their verdict was unanimous is consistent with the New Mexico Supreme Court holding 
in both Salazar and Consul. And then they go through that case law. I agree. That's what the case law said. That's what I've seen in the case law when we reviewed it. Therefore, the court concludes that the Taylor decision and the reasoning set forth therein does not warrant a new trial in the instant action. The court denies all relief requested by defendant. Done, done, and done. This is continuing on to sentencing next week. <sighs> the defense arguments are not well taken. The court was very clear on that. Um, shall we go see all the shade Carrie Morrissey has to throw back at Baldwin's attorneys? I feel like that's just what we need to do next. Um, we're going to have to share a different screen, though, because this is a just too long of a hearing for um for us or too long of a document for us to go through in uh oh i'm going to start highlighting things because if we it it will be fine how can i just demonstrate without highlighting whatever we're going to highlight it'll be it'll be totally fine cuz we're going to pull it up in um good notes because it's so much easier to go through than it is in Google Docs. Who like can we just have a highlight function within Google Docs? Like I don't understand why I can't highlight things and have it I'm going to hit myself in the face. Highlight things and have it stay in Google Docs. Like wh why do I need why do I need separate acts? Also, why can't I turn the background of my do Google Docs to dark mode? Why does everything have to be glaring in my face? I have so many complaints. Can you just let me decide how things should be? <laughs> or at least an option. Can you give me the option? Hey, can we have the option for dark mode in the background of Google Docs? I can't find it anywhere. Hey, can we have an option to just highlight PDFs? Ugh. Um, I'll have to find it. I don't use Chrome when I stream. I only use Firefox when I stream. I should ask Firefox. Just dark, like literally dark mode everything. Just all of it. All of it. <sighs> Same with good notes. Like, can't I just, maybe I can. Mm, format. No, no. It doesn't give me a view option. Mm. Like, why, can, why can't I just set it into dark mode? But no, alas. Let us go to uh, let us go to Good Notes and read this. I'm going to change my highlighter color to pink, which I prefer. Blah, 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 blah. Firefox has a dark mode plugin. I'm going to do that immediately after this stream. See, I knew the law nerds would have some fixes. You guys are great. Thank you. My neurodivergence needs dark mode. All righty, Baldwin. Alec Baldwin has been indicted twice now. I have broken it down on the Emily Show podcast. Alec Baldwin's lawyers filed a extensive motion plus over 300 pages of exhibits arguing that Baldwin's indictment should be dismissed. But not without also throwing a no, oh, excuse me. But not without also throwing a ton of shade at the prosecution attaching their previously sealed or previously not publicly filed motion for sanctions against the prosecution, throwing the prior uh, special prosecutor under the bus, the current special prosecutor under the bus, arguing that the special prosecutor failed to meet their obligations at the grand jury when they indicted Alec Baldwin for the second time. They failed to present to the grand jury as they were required to do the potentially exculpatory evidence. And that is the argument made by Baldwin's attorneys in that extensive motion. It will be linked somewhere in all of this. Today, we are going through at a first look, the state's response. It is also like 300 pages. There are multiple transcripts attached to it, which is part of why it is so long. The motion itself is over 20 pages long. Are we going to be here for at least an hour covering this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is it a first look? Sure is. Yep. And um, we're going to first look at together. So as we first look at together, let's see what the state has to say. I saw some of the headlines about this. 
This was filed Friday. I don't think it was available uh, on the public facing website until over the weekend. I just started seeing, um, I just started seeing some of that on, or some of the headlines on it yesterday. Jessica said in the top right, you can change template paper color. I can, but I don't think it will apply to the PDFs that are in here. I tried that, but let me see. Oh, wait, nope, change template. Hold on, paper color. Mm. That will do the paper color, but it doesn't look like I can do the background, but let's see. I'll try it and see if it works. Um, because, oh, well, here's the problem. I did change my paper color. The problem is the text of my, um, the text of the document is still unfortunately white. It just added a page, um, unfortunately, but we'll figure it out another time. It just, it, it just added me a page. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, good notes, but we tried and I appreciate the help always. Uh, Lawnards, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll figure out this crazy thing. Uh, called life together at some point. We'll just, we'll just keep going. Oh no, it blacked out the entire first page. Hold on. Hold on. Crap. Now we have to undo it. Undo, undo. Edit. No. Where's my undo? Where's my undo? No, wait. How did I get there? Me, Emily, why don't you try to do things in real time? Well, because every now and then I, uh, I do, I do it badly all right let's see if we we no oh no did we lose page one we might have we might have hold on let's see let's see if we can get back to our page one clear page no it just gave us a writing page and then page two. Oh god i tried control z it did not work i have tried i have tried to undo the undo is not undoing. Give me one second, Lonards. Let me uh, close this out and pull it back up without saving, and hopefully it'll all be fine. <laughs> it sure isn't. Where is my page one? Hold on, we'll just repopulate it. It's fine. No, it's not fine. Why? Oh, because I emptied the trash. <laughs> no! Well, Lonards, we tried. Um nice nice chatting today we're gonna be stuck here for a minute give me one second let's see if we change the template back no it won't it will not undo at all it just replaced the page all right i'm gonna have to uh repopulate this <laughs> oh i think it's time Live Miguelina, I tried. Live streaming as a as a professional uh is is always good. So today on Emily versus Tech, we tried, we tried. Um, hold on. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna I just need to re-download it, which will be fine. We're gonna throw on some of our StreamYard background music. Lawnards. Maybe not that one. Mm. I do like this one. We'll go with feeding the ducks. This is our StreamYard background music. Thank you, StreamYard. As we re, uh, repopulate our good notes real quick with the 300 pages, because when I try to do it through my um, through my G Drive, it cannot well process the 300 pages to go through it um, smoothly it skips pages it doesn't populate the back button did not work sadly but it's all right we're just gonna re-download it and throw it back in here it's not not the end of the world and not hard to work around look we live stream because we've got we've got a minute we tried something new didn't work happens a lot <laughs> music to myself said emily tell me again that you were part that part about how you started out on youtube covering tech i did I absolutely did. Um, though it was normally just tech that I was well familiar with. <laughs> so yes, Apple, Apple tech mostly. Um, and I definitely tried things out before I did them on live stream. I didn't live stream much on my own channel. I live streamed on um on on a friend's channel, which was a lot of fun, which is how Miguelina and I met. All right. 
Emily is me taking more time to pick out music than to just do the thing rather than just doing the thing. I, since we're on an ADHD uh, sidetrack, yesterday I, um, I was like, I want to go for a walk, blah, 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 before I record the podcast. It was one of those days where I'm like, we just need to move. Other things need to happen. Blah, blah. It took me maybe 40 minutes to make a new playlist because I could not do anything until a new playlist was made. Um, there are times when I will be tackling long tasks where I cannot tackle said task without either a playlist, the right movie. I need like vibes. We need the right vibes. And so, yes, it took me um, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. 40, 45 minutes to make, I needed a new one. Like my current one, I looked at my current like walking playlist. I was like, Ugh, I hate everything. We need a new one. And um, that's what I did yesterday. And then I had a very lovely walk once I had the new playlist. <laughs> did it take me longer to make a new playlist than I actually walked for? Yeah, because by that point I was like, we have to actually record a podcast episode tonight at some point and I'm not going to get to bed. Did I get to bed before like 3 a.m.? No, I didn't. But I mean, it's fine. My Pokemon sleep score aside, it's it's fine. It's Monday. It's, it's all good. I also wanted to go out and watch the eclipse. Like, you know, my whole day was like, ah, oh, we're going to go watch the eclipse. We're going to make a new playlist. We're going to go for a walk. Shit, it's eight o'clock. Damn it. We have a podcast to do. All right. Let's turn this, let's turn feeding the ducks off. Thank you to StreamYard for giving us the option to have our chill vibes background music. Let's pull this back up and let's actually talk about this motion. Let's see. Can we, I would like to zoom, zoom. I would like to zoom, zoom more. There we go. Hey, that looks pretty, that looks pretty darn good in good notes. I'm, I'm not going to lie here. Um, wait, oh, I'm going to do that badly. All right. It's fine. Whatever. Um, this is going to be fun. We're going to do this in real time. Filed on April 5th, 2024, the, uh, 300 pages of the state's response to the defendant's motion to dismiss the indictment. Everybody ready? Let's roll. We're going to do this together. Can't wait. Love a first look, love a first look where the attorneys are already so salty at each other. It's unbelievable. Finding correct tunes for a thing is the utmost important. It is. Nothing can be done. And when my son is stuck doing something, I'm like, make a new playlist. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, just, you need to make a new playlist. He's like, yeah. And it is the, it is, it is the magic that kind of uncorks the thing. Waiting for the 750 bank. Miguelina, will you let me know in the private chat how close we are so I can let them know? Um... Chelsea Rama, will you please share your ADHD playlist? I'm ADHD and struggle with starting and completing tasks. It's hard to find background noise that's stimulating without being distraction, without being distracting. The th I will look at how I can share my playlist on like a Spotify or whatever. I will look at that. But I will say, uh, Chelsea Rama, this is a highly personal thing because it really for me varies on mood. And me blaring System of a Down and Metallica and The Offspring and Tool into my brain might be distracting for you. <laughs> but some days, that's the playlist I need. Some days, the playlist I need is Vitamin String Quartet playing Tool or playing classics or playing pop music. It is, I can share the things that I like, but also it changes for me depending on what I need to do or am doing or the vibe or the level of energy I need. Sometimes it's Taylor Swift. Sometimes it's uh, show tunes. Sometimes it is anything that was made in the 90s that counts as alternative. Sometimes it's 2010s pop. It really just depends on vibes. Sometimes it is the Cornell bird feeder that just has the bird noises in the background combined with some type of like lo-fi girl feed. Sometimes I just listen to movies that I know very well while I'm doing it. Just, it really depends. And this is why 
task initiation is difficult. <laughs> oh, we're close. You guys, we're we're pretty close. Um, just a couple hundred subs away from 750. Oh, Phantom of the Opera is sometimes work, sometimes sleep. It just depends uh, for me. But yes, Phantom. My son has been listening to a lot of like, ac not acoustic, but instrumental video game music. Um, and sometimes I'll listen to streams. Sometimes, uh, I'll listen, I'll go back and catch up on my friend's streams because I don't want to have to switch YouTube videos. Like I need something that's going to be consistent for at least an hour. Sometimes it's a three hour long podcast from like Lex Friedman or whatever. All right. Let's rock. Shall we? State's response to defendant's motion. I I'm uh, Emily. How much fun are we going to have highlighting in real time? Maybe too much. We'll have to decide if this either distracts us or we love it. I don't know how I feel about it yet, but um, we're going to do it. I, RK, I don't often listen to the Hamilton soundtrack when I try to work because I find myself trying to sing along too much and then I get distracted. <laughs> Comes now the state of New Mexico by and through special prosecutors Morrissey and Lewis, who submit the following response to defendant's motion to dismiss indictment. I will let you know that I cannot pronounce all of Baldwin's trial attorney's last names, and I will be renaming them for that reason, or just saying defense attorney. Defendant's motion to dismiss is a predictably false, misleading, and histrionic misrepresentation of the facts and circumstances of the history of the case. I think we're just going to put the shade in blue. <laughs> histrionic is a... Uh, is, is a lot. <gasps> oh boy. Two special prosecutors who have been assigned to the prosecution of Mr. Baldwin have experienced near countless, near countless lies and manipulation from the defense for more than one year. Off we go, off we go. In addition, we have and certainly will continue to be the subject of defendants' contrived and unwarranted personal attacks. Wow. The primary goal of Mr. Baldwin and his counsel, which now numbers eight trial attorneys, um, from, you know, Heather LeBlanc local counsel. Oh, we're gonna take, we're gonna take pot shots at them too. Okay, good. Heather LeBlanc, local counsel, who, despite her reputation for hard work and competence, has been relegated to largely menial tasks. <laughs> tell them you're calling them sexist without tell without calling them sexist, ma'am. Heather LeBlanc, they're like, we respect her. Too bad y'all don't. Heather Sh or Alex Shapiro, New York, Luke. Nicodemus in New York, John Bash in Texas, Sarah Clark in Texas, Michael Nosechuk, Nosenchuk, Michael in New York, Jennifer in New York, Stephanie in New York. Remember when they were talking about this was the former special prosecutor? It's like, we're not just here to feed billable hours to fancy New York City attorneys. I think more of that's coming. Um, I lost the point. Where was the point? The primary goal of Mr. Baldwin and his counsel is to ensure that the case is not heard on its merits. And if it is heard on its merits to discredit the prosecution, investigation and witnesses in the media so that a conviction becomes unlikely for reasons that have nothing to do with Mr. Baldwin's criminal culpability. Have you met trial work, ma'am? Also, I, I would like to point out that the prosecution started with the media before the defense did. And that was before Carrie Morrissey became the special prosecutor, but like that, that ship had already sailed. Like the prosecution was already slinging arrows towards Baldwin's camp before any of this. Carrie Morrissey is finding that as a prosecutor, you often have to lay in the bed that your colleagues have made. And that's not always a, a comfortable thing. Not everybody pulls the sheets tight. Some people use really scratchy sheets. Some people don't make the bed at all. And you're just like, what is this clusterfuck? I don't even see a bed. 
But as a prosecutor, what you get to do is pick up somebody else's um, case and figure it out. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, it says it is the job of the special prosecutors to investigate the case and fairly and impartially prosecute the case. And we will continue to do so despite the defendant's relentless attempts to discredit and intimidate the prosecution. Ma'am. And the courageous witnesses who continue to participate in the struggle for justice for Helena Hutchins and her family. Wait a second. Who's talking to witnesses? Ooh, I have questions. Who's talking to witnesses? Who is talking to witnesses? Given the exhaustive nature of the defendant's motion to dismiss. <laughs> you're exhausting. It was a little exhausting. Given the exhaustive nature of the defendant's motion to dismiss, we will begin the response by providing a recitation of the factual and procedural history of the case as we know it. Your Honor, Your Honor, they filed their truth, but there is a the truth. Can we get to the truth? I'm already exhausting. I'm already exhaustion. I'm already exhausted. But no, I think she meant exhaustive nature. I think she meant thorough, maybe. I don't know. In October 2021, Mr. Baldwin began filming Rust on the Bonanza Creek Ranch in Santa Fe County, New Mexico. Oh, you guys, um, I'm wondering if we're going to get some name dropping in here. I wonder how many times Jensen Eccles will come up. Chat, will will one of you assign yourselves to keep a, a Jensen count? Keep count? Name drop count. I'm wanting to see how many celebrity names pop up in this motion, and we're only on page two. I figure now is a good time to start a counter. Rust is a story that was written by Joel Souza with participation by Alec Baldwin and coincidentally is a story about a boy who kills a man due to an accidental discharge of a gun. Facts. So far, I, I see truth. Mr. Baldwin hired Mr. Souza to write the screenplay and sold the rights to the story to Rust Production LLC. So Baldwin found the story through his company and then sold his story to Rust. Interesting. Uh, Mr. Baldwin later became the lead producer on the film. According to the film's call sheet, Mr. Baldwin is the top listed producer and the lead actor in the film. See exhibit L. Just in case we forget which exhibits we want to see. Call sheet, why not? This was Mr. Baldwin's project, and that fact is clear when viewing the many video clips from filming of the movie and interviewing the crew and members. Mr. Baldwin was in charge. Russ Productions hired Hannah Gutierrez as a young and inexperienced armorer to manage all of the weapons on the gun-heavy movie set, in addition to fulfilling her role as the props assistant. While it can't be denied that Ms. Gutierrez accepted responsibility for armorer and props assistant, Ms. Gutierrez was only 24 years old and was only legally permitted to purchase guns for a handful of years. I mean, and I was 24 when I became a DA. I mean, I don't know. At some point when you take on the job, you have to take on the job regardless of how old you are. I, I mean, lifeguards start at 18. Um, it, it's a job where people can die if you don't do it right. But I don't know. The whole like, she was 24. It's like, uh, and I don't know. Ms. Gutierrez was only 24 years old and was only legally permitted to purchase guns for a handful of years. In true Hollywood form, Ms. Gutierrez was hired as the armorer due to nepotism. Oh, there's the shade. I mean, that's true. As her father was a well-known armorer, gun handler, and gun coach, many of the crew members on the set of Rust immediately noticed that Ms. Gutierrez was inexperienced and overwhelmed, Likely with a healthy dose of laziness and bravado mixed in. Damn. Shade. Curiously, Mr. Baldwin, the most experienced member of all the cast and crew, seems to have missed what most everyone else noticed. Hannah Gutierrez was not up to the job. Alec Baldwin arrived on set on October 12th, 2021, a week after filming began. Mr. Baldwin's late arrival on set caused him to miss the initial firearms training offered to the actors by Ms. Gutierrez. <clears throat> Baldwin's late arrival made it necessary for Ms. Gutierrez to schedule a separate training session for Mr. Baldwin. I mean, isn't everyone 
isn't everyone expected to like drop everything for Mr. Baldwin anyway? Aaron Evans said, that's not shade. That's a fucking sunburn. <laughs> um, another eclipse today, all of the shade. Chat, um, as always, 10 out of 10 for the uh, humor and the uh, instantaneous uh, jokes. Y y the wit of this community is unparalleled. Angela, this is an eclipse amount of shade right here. For anyone who missed the eclipse, um, the shade is, is all here. Mindy said, I really do love this chat. The wit is absolutely unparalleled. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. Um, Baldwin's late arrival made it necessary for Gutierrez to schedule a separate training for session for Baldwin. If he had the most guns also, that seems like it would be um, like appropriate though. Mr. Baldwin was inattentive during this training and spent time during the training on the phone with his family and making videos of himself shooting the gun for his family's enjoyment. He was like making Snapchats. Okay, wait, this is just, this is just facts we need to come back to. Um, look kids, dad's shooting weapons. Hannah, can you film me? Was she the one filming? Oh. Do we try to get to the Dropbox link later? Chat? Chat? What? Do we try to get to the Dropbox link, chat? Do we just... Do we just see if we can? Do we just see if we can? Runkle has the videos. Do we just see if we... Do we just... Hold on. Um... Let's see if we can grab those real quick. Um, it's in here. I mean, I think I can. Unless Runkle has the link. Runkle! I wonder if Runkle has the link to them somewhere. Um, let me see. Runkle, is Runkle in the chat? Runkle's probably working. Hold on. Let me, I'm going to message Runkle real quick. Runkle! Bat signal. Um, do you have the links to bold one? Mentioned in the prosecution motion. All right, I'm trying to summon, I'm trying to summon Runkle to see, but I think we can grab them from here. This this document will not let me copy and paste, but we can we can probably get to them. Migalina also, um, they are at page, the motion's in the uh, Google Drive, but they're at page four. Oh, Runkle already responded. Runkle for the win. We can summon Runkle. Runkle for the win. We'll get to those in a minute because it's pigeon business. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell him thank you real quick. You rock, chat. Chat mentioned you had them. Sorry for the summons. Um, I typed that wrong. My phone is not working very well. I'm, I'm crankier with this iPhone than I've ever been with an iPhone. All right, we'll get back to the photos later. Upon arriving on set, Mr. Baldwin immediately began demanding the crew and the armor work faster. Immediately is interesting. Mr. Baldwin's relentless rushing of the crew on the movie set routinely compromised safety because Rust is not a romantic comedy. No shit. It is an action-filled Western with dangerous stunts and real guns being used as props. In addition to rushing the cast and crew, Baldwin was frequently screaming and cursing at himself, at crew members, or at no one and for no particular reason. To watch Mr. Baldwin's conduct on the set of Rust is to witness a man who has absolutely no control of his own emotions and absolutely no concern for how his conduct affects those around him. I mean, I don't know about all of you, but I remember very well the voicemail he sent to his, what, 11 or 12 year old daughter at the time, calling her a thoughtless little pig, amongst other things. I never thought necessarily that Baldwin was a human in control of his emotions. 
Witnesses have testified that it was this exact conduct that contributed to safety compromises on set. The combination, the combination of Hannah Gutierrez's negligence and inexperience and Alec Baldwin's complete lack of concern for the safety of those around him would prove deadly for Helena Hutchins, a young cinematographer and rising star in the film industry. We saw so much um, love for her from the witnesses that testified in, in Hannah's trial. So much uh, respect and sorrow that Helena was someone who the world never got to really know through her work because of this. Um, and it was, it was interesting to see them uh, chatting about that. Ms. Hutchins was shot and killed by Alec Baldwin, who pointed a 45 caliber single action army revolver at her, cocked the hammer of the gun and pulled the trigger when a scene was not being filmed and cameras were not rolling. The bullet entered near uh, her body near her right armpit, went through her rib, punctured her lung, severed her spine, and exited her body below the left shoulder, shoulder blade. The bullet then entered the front of the shoulder of director Joel Souza, coming to rest just under the skin on Souza's back by his shoulder. Um, part of that is because of the size of the caliber. Part of that is because of how close they were together. At this time, the scene was being prepared, during which Baldwin was expected to slowly pull his gun from his holster. That's it. Do we remember the clips we saw of him joking, so do you want me to just whip it out, when he was supposed to be just pulling it slowly across his body, but then he's like, do you want me to just whip it out before lunch? That was shown during Gutierrez's trial. I imagine we're going to see much more of that when we get to Baldwin's trial. Mr. Baldwin decided to go off script and take actions contrary to what the director, Joel Souza, instructed him to do. Well, that wouldn't have been the first time. Oh, keep reading, Emily. To the frustration of Mr. Souza, Baldwin did this frequently. He ignored direction from Mr. Souza without warning and acted on his own volition. Unbeknownst to Mr. Baldwin, Miss Gutierrez was inadvertently, Miss Gutierrez inadvertently loaded a live round into a gun, and Miss Hutchins and Mr. Souza were shot. Miss Hutchins died the same day. Uh, I would have changed it inadvertently to negligently, I think, after her conviction. Almost immediately after this incident, when emergency medical services were still on scene and attempts to stabilize Ms. Hutchins for flight to the UNMH trauma center were underway, Baldwin began preparing the unbelievable narrative that he was not responsible for the discharge of the gun and injuries to his colleagues. He began discussing this defense and nurturing this false narrative before he began his interview with law enforcement the same day of the fatal shooting. How though? How though? How though? Runkle, I've seen <laughs> you have been someone. We're going to watch those videos in just a second. I wanted to get to a, a natural stopping point. Thank you for sending them. Ultimately, Baldwin arrived at the sheriff's department for a formal interview and was and was left momentarily in the interview room after the video recording of the interview began. But before detectives entered the room to begin speaking to Mr. Baldwin. Hmm. During this time, Mr. Baldwin, knowing that Ms. Hutchins had been critically injured and taken by helicopter to a nearby trauma center, and Mr. Souza had been seriously injured and taken to a local hospital for emergency treatment, began to make casual phone and FaceTime video calls. Baldwin called his wife on speakerphone or FaceTime and another personal assistant employee regarding his family's upcoming trip to New Mexico. Baldwin's minor daughter was going to have a small part in the movie, and his family was planning to join him in New Mexico the following day. During these calls, Baldwin asked that his family not cancel the trip to New Mexico despite the tragedy. He explained, I won't work and we'll go and enjoy ourselves. It's all paid for. They're not going to give us the money back. See attachment, um, attached exhibit A, highlighted portion of page three. I mean, are we surprised? Also, at this point, he doesn't know that she has passed, but he doesn't seem particularly traumatized by the fact that two people were shot and taken to the hospital. You would think that after that happened at work, you would be, um, I don't know, saying, I'm not going to be working, but this is awful and I would like my family to be here. You think you would want your family for comfort, not a, yeah, we'll just make it a vacation. It's already paid for. Like, it's fine. You saw how traumatized the EMT was when she testified. I don't know if this motion would have hit me quite the same way 
if we hadn't seen the trial for Hannah Gutierrez already and had the EMT's description of how horrific this day was. Hear Joel Souza talk about it. Hear um, Ross Adiago talk about it. The people that were in that church, Baldwin pulled the trigger, but the people that were in that church were forever altered by what happened. And he's just like, we'll go enjoy ourselves. Um, okay. Uh, okay. I mean, okay. Mr. Baldwin proceeded to provide a video recorded interview with detectives where he described the incident that led to the shooting of Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza. I went over parts of that uh, probably two years ago now, uh, maybe on the podcast, maybe, um, yeah, I think on the podcast, I also went over his interview with um, Stephanopoulos. Um, let's see. The high points of Mr. Baldwin's inter initial interview are highlighted for the court in the state's Exhibit A. We're just highlighting the exhibits now. In sum, Mr. Baldwin stated numerous times that Hannah Gutierrez handed him the gun before the incident and Mr. Hall's never handed him the gun. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Baldwin stated on two occasions that he shot and fired the gun. He stated numerous times that he, referring to Sousa, was telling him where to point the gun during rehearsal, not Miss Hutchins. Well, that changed because when he talked to George Stephanopoulos, he said Helena was telling him what to do. And Helena kept saying, you know, show it to me, show it to me. And he's like, like this, like this, like this in the Stephanopoulos interview that I break down on the podcast. But it seems that the initial interviews, that's not the that's not what he said. It's also worth noting that Mr. Baldwin stated that Ms. Hutchins turned her body while speaking to someone else, and that is why she was struck in the armpit. Mr. Baldwin never stated during his lengthy interview with law enforcement that Ms. Hutchins, uh, that's not shade, that's just uh, interesting. Mr. Baldwin never stated during his lengthy interview with law enforcement that Ms. Hutchins told him where to point the gun or gave him any instructions about what to do with the gun during the rehearsal or blocking when the gun discharged. Baldwin did state during his initial interview that the gun just went off. He was not expecting a live round to be in the gun. I mean, I bet no one was and stated he didn't pull the trigger. It is true that Mr. Baldwin consented to the extraction of his cell phone by the Suffolk County Police Department, but only permitted a very limited report to be generated for New Mexico law enforcement to review. I mean, that's there's nothing wrong with that, though. There's I mean, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that though he he consented with limitations like that's there's not there uh. i know they want to make that something but that's not that's just his defense attorneys doing their job the special prosecutors learned recently that baldwin has since obtained the extraction data from the suffolk county department so it can no longer be accessed by law enforcement shouldn't you have it though like Shouldn't you have it though? Runkle, this is a fair point. Runkle said only thing wrong is when he's then touting, I was so helpful. He was helpful in a limited way. But like, shouldn't you already have this? On December 3rd, after obviously, after obviously having conferred with counsel, Baldwin participated in a televised interview with George Stephanopoulos. This was a terrible idea. All of this was a bad idea. They did attach a transcript. I broke it down in the Emily Show podcast if you want to see my thoughts on it. During this interview, everything changed in Mr. Baldwin with the aid of his attorneys. I don't know how you know that to be factual. I don't know how you know that to be factual. Mr. Baldwin with the aid of his attorneys lied with impunity and blamed the incident on Ms. Hutchins. You can go watch it, see what you think. Mr. Baldwin changed his story and stated repeatedly that it was Ms. Hutchins who was telling him where to point the gun and to point the gun at her. In his shameless attempt to escape culpability for his own negligence and, negligence and recklessness, he went so far as to say that he pointed the gun at Ms. Hutchins' armpit because that was where she told him to point it. I don't remember that from the uh, interview. 
This statement was in direct contradiction to his previous statement on October 21st, 2021, and very pointedly in direct contradiction to the portion of his October 21st, 2021 statement where he clearly explained that Ms. Hutchins was struck in the armpit because she was turning to speak to someone else. Very notably, this is the first time that Baldwin claimed he never pulled the trigger of the gun, thereby calling into question the functionality of the gun. He just said, boom, it went off. On December 8th, Baldwin provided a recorded interview with Lorenzo Montoya of the New Mexico OSHA. That's an interview we haven't seen yet, but that is attached in a transcript. In this interview, Baldwin's story changed again, they say. When speaking to OSHA, Baldwin told new lies and doubled down on previous lies. They're just, they're just calling him a lying liar that lies. Again, Baldwin stated that he didn't pull the trigger of the gun. In a surprising turn of events, Baldwin stated that Mr. Halls, the first AD, handed the gun to him. Remember Mr. Halls said like he was being set up, that it was Hannah that handed the gun, and Hannah's like, I wasn't even in the church. This was in direct contradiction to the numerous times that Baldwin stated that Hannah Gutierrez handed him the gun when he was interviewed on October 21st, 2021. Again, if we're going to talk about why you don't interview with police after a traumatic event, look. Is Baldwin lying here or just, I know a lot of you don't like Alec Baldwin. I completely get it. Putting the Baldwin of the whole thing aside, my question to this point is, is he willfully lying or because the armorer handed him the gun most of the time on set, his memory just kind of defaulted to Hannah handed me the gun because that's what he thinks happened, even if he doesn't have a great memory of the moment. It is possible that he doesn't have a great memory of the moment. All of his police interviews aren't helping himself. He's going to be a great witness against himself, like Hannah was a great witness against herself. I don't know if some of these parts are a lie or a memory after a traumatic event. I don't know. So in that, I'm just, there is a possibility that that shifts, but I think it's going to be really hard to explain because you've got multiple interviews saying it one way and then another interview saying it another way. It's going to be very, very difficult to explain. But as to that part, I agree, Lyndon. I think it could be an honest mistake um, of who handed him the gun. But when you, if that was the only thing that was an issue, then it wouldn't be such a big deal. But when you have thing after thing after thing after thing, then it becomes a bigger deal. And then it's harder for a jury to understand inconsistencies because it's not just one thing that can be explained. Memory can be faulty. It could be, I could have sworn she handed me the gun because she always hands me the gun. But then when I thought about it and later, um, after I'd kind of processed what happened, I remembered it wasn't her. That one thing is explainable to a jury. But when so much changes, the jury is going to look at this and be like, but you lied here and you lied there and you lied there. So even if this one thing's an honest mistake, we don't fucking care. And that is the problem with how many interviews he gave, including televised interviews. They will, if he tries to testify, he's not going to be able to explain all of these inconsistencies, I don't think. Do you think Alec Baldwin's going to testify at his trial? Hold on. We're going we're gonna to put that up as a poll. Give me a second. Where did my chat go? Because um, I don't see there's any possibility that he, that he doesn't testify. I, I, cause his lawyers can say, do not do this. And the judge will look at him and say, do you want to testify? Even if his lawyers say, do not do this, he could say, yes, I do. So this question is super premature, but based on what we know, I'm putting the poll up anyway. Do you think Baldwin will want to testify? I think he wants to have the last word. I think it's why, I think it's why he went on Stephanopoulos. I think that he could not stand, and I will say I understand this, I think he could not stand that other people were talking about him and he felt that he needed to explain himself. I don't think it's a good idea, 
But I, I think he was like, I have to explain. You just don't understand. You just don't get it. I'm going to tell you why what you're thinking about me is wrong. Which, when you could be charged criminally, is not a good thing. Um, it goes on to say this was in direct contradiction to the numerous times Baldwin stated Hannah handed him the gun. Baldwin's news story to OSHA on December 8th, 2021 included new misrepresentations that Seth Kinney was on the set of rest on October 21st, 2021, and that he heard this from very reliable people. Interesting. Baldwin asserted that Seth Kinney was one of the people who may be responsible for providing live rounds onto the set of Rust. I will just say that is a reasonable conclusion. If Seth Kinney is the one providing ammo to the set of Rust, it is reasonable to say that he may be perhaps the person who provided it. Defense counsel have never provided the special prosecutors the names of the very reliable people. The very, the very reliable people who told Mr. Baldwin that Kenny was on set the day of the shooting. When Baldwin planted the seed that Kenny was on set on October 21st and provided live rounds to the movie set on October 21st, the digital evidence proving that the live rounds were on set long before October 21st had not yet been uncovered and disclosed. This was yet another falsehood put forth by Baldwin to deflect blame away from himself and on to others. As the OSHA interview continued, Baldwin's story took a very interesting turn. Ooh, tell me. Mr. Baldwin vacillated between claiming he had virtually no experience with guns and almost daily experience with guns. For any of you who watched my coverage of his interview with police or um, watched his interview, he very much um, explains to law enforcement why he knows everything about guns. Mr. Baldwin stated that he pulled the hammer of the gun back, but was not going to cock the gun. Anyone who has ever shot a single action revolver understands that pulling the hammer back is precisely the action that cocks the gun, thus making Baldwin's assertions contradictory and absurd. As we get to the prosecution calling Baldwin's statements absurd, do you think the prosecutor is poking at him? Do you think the prosecutor's maybe needling Baldwin a little bit. So by the time they get to trial, Baldwin is like, no, I'm going to tell you fucking what. Like, it, is she also planting seeds here? Is the prosecution just, um, just planting those little seeds that are going to bloom by the time that Baldwin gets here? Because Baldwin is going to want to look at this prosecutor and be like, look, bitch, let me tell you what's up. Because I feel like this is just, just a little bit of a, of prodding at Baldwin. Look, they made the motion. She gets to respond. But I, I, do, I do think this is intentional poking of the bear. I'm not going to comment on, uh, on how that strategy is going to go. Um, because uh, I think that might work. And I can't say as a prosecutor, I have I have never ever um, tried a case in a way where I hoped the defendant would feel so compelled to testify. And in white collar crime cases and financial crime cases, you often get defendants who think they're the smartest ones in the room. So if you can present them an opportunity to explain to you as the prosecutor why you're wrong, uh, they often will try to take that opportunity to explain to you and to the jury why you're wrong and they are correct. I I think there's a little bit of a of a of poking here. Baldwin also stated that when pulling the hammer back, he did not hear the clicking sounds that the gun makes at a back to the cock, at a quarter cock, half cock, or full cock while the hammer is being cocked. Whether Mr. Baldwin realized it or not, at the time of his statement when the gun handler pulls the hammer back on a single action army revolver and doesn't hear clicks, it means the trigger is fully depressed during the cocking sequence. Oopsie. 
Runkle said, okay, need to do a clicky click video. Um, oopsie, oopsie, oopsie. Um, because again, if you're like, if, if the, uh, if the trigger's down, you're not going to get the click, click, click. Oops, oopsie. To an experienced gun handler, Mr. Baldwin's statement that he did not hear hammer clicks is synonymous with the trigger being pulled. Oh, no. Not synonymous. Whoopsie doodle muffin. You, uh, you, you, you walked yourself into admitting that you had your finger on the trigger, though. I know from watching my friend, Runkle of the Bailey, who is a firearms expert, Canadian defense attorney, that the amount of pressure needed to be put on a trigger can vary. Do I think there is a possibility that Baldwin had his finger on the trigger in a way where when he was moving his thumb, he did not appreciate how much pressure he was putting on the trigger? That's absolutely possible. But that is why you put your finger on the side or the trigger guard and not inside the trigger guard, even near where the trigger is. But the amount of control it would take to um, pull back that hammer and not have your finger on the trigger and not have your thumb pull your finger in, I think would be something that not even an expert weapon handler would do because um, hands are hands. So when you're cocking the gun, your finger stays outside of the trigger guard. So if his hand was inside, I don't, I, I don't think there's a way his finger wasn't on the trigger. But he's admitted that without admitting it. I think this is what Bruce Rivers would call self snitching. But uh, he did all, all of these things. And the thing is, when you think you're going to be smarter than law enforcement, law enforcement will find enough people that even if you're not smarter than one of them, you're not going to be smarter than all 50 plus whatever people that look at your case. Alec Baldwin actor is never going to be smarter than multiple FBI weapons experts. It's just not going to happen. They will out people you and they will look through everything you say and out people you. <sighs> to an experienced gun handler, Mr. Baldwin's statement that he did not hear the hammer clicks is synonymous with the trigger being pulled. Mr. Baldwin made the false statements that he did not pull the hammer all the way back. This assertion has already been disproven by forensic testing of the firing pin impressions on the spent casings from the live round that, that killed uh, Miss Hutchins. And then that gets into Lucian Hag's ballistic report. Finally, and despite his lawyer's attempt to mislead the state, the court, and the public about the functionality of the gun, 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 sorry, Chicago, Mr. Baldwin made a truthful statement and acknowledged, they're like, wow, one, and acknowledged that the gun functioned properly and that the only problem with the gun was that there was a live round in it. In sum, every time Mr. Baldwin spoke, a different version of events emerged from his mouth. They could have used snarkier word than emerge, but all right. And his later statements contradicted his previous statements in his attorney's assertion as set forth in their motions to dismiss. Yet the attorneys can't put the shit back in the horse after he's already given so many interviews. They can only try to make it less messy. But the shit's already out of the horse. Mr. Baldwin's interview with George Stephanop after after Baldwin's interview with George Stephanopoulos, detectives became aware that Mr. Baldwin was claiming that the gun discharged without the trigger being pulled. Even though this assertion is absurd on its face, law enforcement was dedicated to a full and fair investigation. And in response to Baldwin's claim, the gun was sent to the FBI for forensic testing. That's when they started whacking it around with a mallet. The FBI tested the gun and was only able to make the gun fire apps in a trigger pull when the hammer was in its full resting position. This is not a malfunction, as defense counsel would like the court to believe. This is a predictable and is a known consequence of the gun's design. In fact, the manufacturer's manual for the gun cautions against the handler keeping around in the cylinder and chamber that aligns with the firing pin. 
because significant pressure on the hammer can press the firing pin into the primer of the cartridge and discharge a bullet. The FBI hit the hammer of the gun with a rawhide mallet on numerous occasions when the hammer was in the quarter, half, and full cock positions in an attempt to test Baldwin's assertion and ultimately and unsuccessfully tried so hard and so often. Oh, God. They did it so hard. <laughs> And so often, yikes, did it so hard and so often to make the gun fire absent pulling of the trigger that the gun finally broke. Yes, the gun, I think they said was fired, test fired successfully 12 or 16 times, somewhere in that range, before they started doing the destructive testing. And once they did the destructive testing, uh, they beat the hammer with a mallet so often that they wore down and broke the cock notch of the gun. And we saw pictures of that in Hannah Gutierrez's trial, which would not have been received the same way, but for the fact that Hannah Gutierrez did name her phone Gorilla Grip Pussy Pal. So once we had gotten past Gorilla Grip Pussy Pal into two days of cock notches, um, there was no containing, there was no just no containing it. So we we tried. We tried. The gun was not destroyed as defense counsel claimed, but a small number of the internal mechanisms that engage when the gun is in the full cock position were damaged. And one such mechanism was the full cock notch on the gun's hammer and trigger seer. Yes. The FBI beat off the cock notch with a hammer. I, I don't. Look, when I did the Law Nerd After Dark episode for the trademark dispute over Ringo Starr's name and Ringo sold on Adam and Eve, uh, com. When I talked about the Ringo and the Ringo and the other products made, um, by the company that makes the Ringo, which is actually, or was at the time a bestseller on Adam and Eve.com. I did not think that beyond the Ringo case that we would have a case that was a full after dark case when talking about a weapon then again, most of the cases I have dealt with do not deal with single action revolvers because it is not the old West. So we are going to go into another trial with an entire multiple witnesses talking about full cock, half cock, quarter cock, and cock notches. And we're just not going. We're just not going to be able to 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 rein to rein it back in from there. After an investigation by the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department that took approximately one year, the case file was turned over to the First Judicial District Attorney's Office for review for possible criminal charges. And in January 2023, charges were filed against Baldwin, Gutierrez, and Halls. Halls quickly accepted responsibility and entered a plea deal to a misdemeanor. You offered him a plea that required him to do nothing but say, sorry, kind of. Ian, good to see you. You've inspired me with a mighty need to record, but love your coverage takes and we'll be back. Bye, Runkle. Good to see you. Go talk about the clicky, clicky, clacky, clacky. And um, see how many times you can say cock in one video. I'm just saying, YouTube does not hate the word half cock, full cock, quarter cock. The word that YouTube hates the most is see you next Tuesday, but the, 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 these are fine. In this context, I'm not, this is not legal advice on what will or will not be demonetized on the platform of YouTube. I am not a representative of Google. I am not a Google lawyer. I am not a YouTube lawyer and I do not speak for that. I am just saying in this context of explaining things, it is not a problem generally. Okay, now that that disclaimer is out of the way. Shortly after the charges against Baldwin were filed, his attacks and retaliation against the prosecutors for daring to hold him responsible began. This shouldn't have come as a surprise to undersigned counsel, given Mr. Baldwin's history of attacking anyone who tries to hold him accountable for his bad acts. Well, that is a, that is a personal statement, if I've ever seen one in a court filing. Yeah, yikes. You're the prosecutor, man. A more complete recitation of Mr. Baldwin's history of attacks and deflection 
with the aid of his counsel, is set forth on pages 16, 17, and 18 of the attached Exhibit D. Oh, well, um, chat, there's a chart of Baldwin's history of attacks and deflection. Chat, remind me that no matter what, we have to go to Exhibit D. <laughs> Can you not today? Yes, exactly. Poke, 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 poke. It's like Facebook. She's like, Facebook, bring back the poke button. Poke, poke, poke. <sighs> well, there is merit. Holy shit. We're admitting that there's merit. Well, there is merit to the defendant's assertion that he was incorrectly charged with the firearm enhancement. Okay, because he fucking was. It was embarrassing. Like, are you not embarrassed? And the this is the prior prosecutor's position as any state legislator may have precluded her from serving as special prosecutors. These were innocent mistakes that were quickly cured by the dismissal of the firearm enhancement and by the former special prosecutor resigning. Were they innocent though? They were embarrassed. Like you're the state. I can't wait to hear Emily go to the D. Oh, we're definitely exhibit D is, ex is, is absolutely happening. We've got to get a little further through this. Um, Lori in the chat says, can we check out Exhibit D, though? We will. Oh, don't worry. We will. Um, they're like, these were in a, They were elementary and embarrassing. I appreciate that the prosecution is trying to, like, make that not as bad as it is, but literally, come on. Like, serious. Seriously. It was... You, <sighs> Any prosecutor would have known that you couldn't have charged that gun allegation. And even when I read the gun allegation and talked about it in podcast, I thought I was crazy because as I was talking about it, I was sitting there going, um, this doesn't seem to apply. Am I wrong? Because everything else seemed wild. Any allegation that the former prosecutor is engaging in an unethical any allegation that the former prosecutors engaged in an unethical disparagement of Mr. Baldwin by providing limited statements to the press is legally unsound. As has been previously litigated in the case against Hannah Gutierrez and during the Baldwin grand jury litigation, the media contact by Ms. Carmack Altwees and uh, Ms. Reeb was not unethical or unlawful and was done in response to Mr. Baldwin's and Mr. Bowles's own public appearances and misleading statements to the press. They're like, it wasn't, it wasn't, Your Honor, it was responsive. We had to. It's so much easier if you just don't talk to the media. Mr. Baldwin made numerous public appearances to spread misinformation about the case, protect his already tarnished public image, and try to sway the public and future jury in his favor. I get, did he go on Stephanopoulos before he was charged? He did. Um, I still think like a written statement would have been enough because again, you're the prosecution. You're not on a level playing field with the defendant in this. You, you have to be ab above it. As discussed above, Baldwin appeared on national television on December 3rd and shamelessly lied about his conduct and blamed the victim for her own death. <sighs> on August, well, he also called himself a victim. On August 19th, Baldwin again used his celebrity status to sway public opinion concerning the details of the investigation into the death of Helena Hutchins by appearing on CNN for an in-person interview with Chloe Mellis. And then there's a link to that. On August 19th, defense attorney appeared in an interview with Chloe prior to any charging decisions against his client being announced. Defense counsel stated any criminal charges against his client would be a huge miscarriage of justice. I mean, that is an opinion of a defense attorney. And I think anyone who looked at that statement would be like, well, of course that's what his his defense attorney would say. Um, 
Nolan, if you go and watch his interview with Stephanopoulos, he tries to say he's not trying to liken himself to Helena Hutchins and then says, but we're both in this same boat where this thing happened that neither of us were expecting. And, and he very much put himself in that boat that neither of us knew this gun was loaded. Neither of us expected this to happen and, and go through um, what happened there. But I break down again, his Stephanopoulos interview on the Emily show. We'll link it down below. Um, he tries to say he's not gonna, and then he does, in my opinion. Go watch, you might take it differently. A prosecutor is not required to stay silent under these circumstances. She was permitted to rebut the parade of misinformation spread by Mr. Baldwin, his counsel and counsel for Mr. Uh, Ms. Gutierrez. Some of these things could have been done in like an email. The New Mexico Rules of Professional Conduct, 16306A, trial publicity states. And again, if this sounds familiar to you, it's because this is from the model rules. This is the same model rules that we have seen covered in Idaho, that we've covered in the Girardi bankruptcy and other cases. It's the exact same model rules that we see um, jurisdictions, you know, on and on. A lawyer shall not make any extrajudicial or out of form statement in a proceeding that may be tried to a jury that the lawyer knows or reasonably should know that one is false, two creates a clear and present danger of prejudicing the proceeding. The committee commentary goes on to state in footnote six, finally extrajudicial statements that may otherwise raise a question under this rule may be permissible, this is what they're keying on, when they are made in response to statements made publicly by another party, another party's lawyer, or third persons, where a reasonable lawyer would believe a public response is required in order to avoid prejudice to the lawyer's client. When prejudicial statements have been made publicly, made by others, responsive statements may have the salutary effect of lessening any resulting adverse impact on the adjudicative process. Such responsive statements should be limited to contain only such information as is necessary to mitigate undue prejudice created by the statements made by others. It is perplexing that Mr. Baldwin would complain about pre-trial publicity when it was he who elected to appear on national news and use his celebrity status to publicly lie about the facts and circumstances of Miss Hutch Hutchins's death. The shade. They have gotten very feisty in their filings, but the defense did throw a lot of arrows at the prosecution, so I'm not super surprised. The prosecution is permitted to respond to statements made by defendant to lessen the adverse impact on the adjudic, the adjudic, blah, 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 blah. I, on the, the proceedings. <laughs> Why my brain has stopped being able to pronounce words, I don't know, but it did just there, just whoop. In March, 2023, undersigned counsel and co-counsel prosecutor Jason Lewis were appointed special prosecutors on all Rust-related cases. They reached out to the defense attorneys to establish a civil working relationship after some brief introductory meetings. Defense counsel requested that the defense counsel and counsel for the state meet in person to fully discuss the case against Baldwin. Undersigned counsel graciously and naively agreed. Oh boy. Naively agreed, the foreshadowing, the foreshadowing chat what happens on april 12th defense counsel his associate and his associate sarah clark flew to santa fe to meet with special prosecutors to discuss the case against baldwin during this four-hour meeting defense counsel displayed a powerpoint presentation okay that outlined his arguments against the prosecution of his client during this meeting counsel stated that if the case proceeded he may call a variety of a-list actors to testify on mr baldwin's behalf and specifically re-referenced oh boy harrison ford and helen mirren helen harrison did y'all know that baldwin's lawyers are like 
Fine then. Bet. We'll call Helen Mirren. Do it. I want to know what Helen Mirren has to say about any of this. What? <laughs> Do you think that's going to scare the prosecution? Don't make me call Harrison Ford. I, sir, I would be fucking delighted. You can you can you really summon Han Solo? Like, are you going to bring? Are you are you going to bring him here? And then if so, can I ask him who really shot first? Like, I have so many questions for Harrison Ford. Can, and we're not even we're not even getting into Indiana Jones and any of that. Like, sir, don't threaten me with a good time. D don't. Don't. <laughs> oh my god i would <laughs> please do counsel please do please do i would be fucking delighted to sit down and have a chat with harrison ford i had the pleasure of interacting with a few celebrities just by the nature of where i worked and um they were they were delightful unless they were being prosecuted and then they were not thrilled um you know we had a full a full a full lindsay lohan day in court where she was wearing a very very tight white dress with absolutely zero underpinnings emily how did you know that because it was that obvious mm-hmm um also courthouses are disgusting so what i would never advise is that <laughs> oh my god okay but i will say it is um it is not improper and it is not uncommon for defense attorneys to show up pre-filing and say can we have a pre-filing interview? Can I tell you our side of the case? Can I tell you what we think the defenses will be? Can we give you more information to inform your decision? This is something that often happens with private defense attorneys. Public defenders aren't often given the, um, the opportunity to know that a client is their client until that person has been charged and then is being indicted and assigned to them. This is something that with private attorneys, if you take a case that you know might be indicted, you have the opportunity to go to prosecutors and ask for it to be um, reduced. So this is not uncommon. I have been in meetings like this. There is no shade to this at all. Um, it's, it's part of being, I think, a good private defense attorney is building the relationship with the prosecutor's office when you know that a case may be filed to call and ask for that type of meeting, which is why when you are looking for defense attorneys, you need someone who practices in the area that knows the offices to um, have those conversations. Anyway, during the meeting, defense counsel said that he may call a variety of A-list actors. Don't threaten me with a good time is my response to that. Defense counsel went further and stated that if the case were to proceed, he would call Baldwin's supporting actor, on rust jensen eccles again don't threaten me with a good time bring it bring it bring the jensen bring the jensen bring the jensen again bring the jensen as a witness for the defense defense counsel explained that eccles would testify that even though he personally checked his prop gun for live rounds routinely he would not have checked it if he had been in the same position as mr baldwin Great. Bring the Jensen to trial. We would love to hear what he has to say. Defense counsel asserted that Baldwin's position as producer on film gave him power over creative decisions only and that his contract spelled those limitations out clearly. That does not surprise me. And that does, that seems in line with the testimony that we saw during Hannah's trial that he might have been a creative producer only. That doesn't surprise me. Nearly all of counsel's statements, uh, all of defense counsel's statements during the meeting would later be determined to be false or misleading. I mean, it's from their perspective as an advocate for their client. 
Um, also, Don't Threaten Me With A Good Time always makes me think of the song. And I do have a, a dear and lovely friend who is a prosecutor who regularly uses that with the defense attorneys. When they call and say things like, so the defendant might testify, she's like, don't threaten me with a good time and not follow through. Um, because it doesn't happen a lot. And I've never met a prosecutor that when somebody says, well, the defendant will testify, has said anything other than, oh, please, can they? Please let that happen. That would be delightful. Prosecutors don't get to do a lot of cross-examination. So if you're like, hey, hey, we've got um, all of these witnesses. Prosecutors are like, oh, 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 I get to cross-examine? Let me loose. Like, let me cook. Because they don't get to do it as nearly as much. Um, and yes, I would sing the Panic at the Disco song, but I wonder if that might actually push the boundaries. <laughs> push the boundaries of um of of what is of what is allowed here on the platform, especially as it comes to the chorus. But it is a song I do enjoy karaokeing. So um the deadline for defendant to list witnesses under Rule 5-502 was March 1st, 2024. Not surprisingly, he has failed to list Mr. Ford, Dame Miram, and or Mr. Eccles. I don't lie to me. Come on now. Put damn it. In fact, undersigned counsel recently contacted Mr. Eccles. I love being a legal commentator, but I'll help make these phone calls. I hate making phone calls. Look, I will put off scheduling things for like a year and a half, but I will make this call. If if you, just if you need anything, uh, the chat volunteers. In fact, underside counsel recently contacted Mr. Eccles and was notified that no one from Baldwin's defense team has ever reached out to him and requested he testify on Baldwin's behalf. Baldwin lawyers don't lie to us. The internet is mad. The chat is also mad that the prosecution has not put the correct respect on Dame Helen Mirren's name. Agreed with you, chat. Agreed. Agre agreed. Agreed. Respect needs to be put. Defense counsel intentionally made, I mean, the, uh, tomorrow when we get into counsel slinging mud at each other, it's going to get worse in the podcast. But attributing volition to what's going on is not going to go well. You are the prosecutor in this situation. <laughs> Chat has called Jensen Eccles to the stand. Yes. Yes. Um, Brandis, I, I keep trying to say it that way. And the, the, the way that it comes out of my mouth is not right. I'm aware. I, I, I try. It's, at some point, Eccles is going to be what it is. I'm trying to say the first one, and if it sounds like the second one, it is just, I cannot. <sighs> All right. In his motion, uh, let's say, defense counsel intentionally made numerous false statements in his motion to dismiss, but one of the most shocking is his assertion that the defense provided the state the gun you, wait, that the defense provided to the state. This sentence doesn't make any sense. I'm just going to read the words as they say, but my brain has literally stopped processing what's happening in this sentence. Defense intentionally made numerous false statements in his motion to dismiss, but one of the most shocking is his assertion that the defense provided to the state that the gun used by Mr. Baldwin was modified. I feel like there's words missing. Oh, proved. It's me. I can't read. And that's why the sentence makes no sense. Thanks, chat. This is why I live stream with the chat. Because <laughs> my, my brain filled in words that didn't exist. And this is why I pulled documents up on stream. Literally, the reason I started streaming and using StreamYard was because... I knew with the, not only the visual processing issues, but with the dyslexia and the ADHD that this would absolutely happen. And this is literally the reason is so that the chat can be like, girl, we can see that word and it's not the one you're saying. 
this is why the this moment is why we do it this way um because i honestly staring at the white background for pages and pages and pages will make my brain start to just fill in words that don't exist even with my erlen glasses continuing on the defense did not apparently prove to the state that the gun was modified on april 18th Defense counsel emailed undersigned counsel three photos of revolver parts. One of the photos was from the FBI examination of the gun used to kill Ms. Hutchins. The other two presumably came from the defense firearms expert, Brian, who was yet to be listed as a witness for the defendant. Really? 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 The defense firearms expert is not yet listed as a witness for the defendant, despite the fact that he examined the evidence revolver at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department on April 12th, 2023, and is scheduled to examine it again in the coming weeks. Aren't we getting close to the, um, aren't we getting close to the cutoff? Aren't we getting close to the cutoff? Steel City said, you proved that you need chat to provide proper information. Yes, it is. Chat is bay. I don't understand streamers that just scream at their chat. It doesn't seem fun for anybody. And I love it. Isn't, aren't we reaching the cutoff for the witness list though? I mean, I guess the prosecution's aware that the witness exists, but aren't we, isn't there a cutoff there somewhere? Okay, boo. Like these attorneys all get paid way more than I ever made as a lawyer. And, uh, all got hired at firms that would never that would have looked at me and been like and um so i'm like i'm not questioning what they're doing but uh like i thought there was a cutoff joseph in the chat says cutoff was march 1st i, I thought there was a cutoff like Chat's like, keep reading, Emily, keep reading. It gets better. Okay, we're going to keep going. I'm just, I'm, su I'm surprised at this. Defense counsel Nicodemus used these photos to convince undersigned counsel that the hammer. Were you convinced or did he try to convince you? Rebecca said they mentioned 3-1 earlier in the motion. I knew they did. Thank you. Uh, question in the chat, uh, monuments of speculation, Harvard and Yale trained lawyers. Yes. Weed mom said if they aren't on the list, can they be added? Generally not if there's a cutoff. Okay. So defense attorney used the photos to convince undersigned counsel. Was the prosecution admitting that they were convinced that the hammer of the revolver may have been modified because it appeared to be visibly visibly different than similar exemplar hammers. Undersigned counsel had already retained the services of Lucian Hag, who was um, to be assisted by his son, Michael Hag. They testified at the last trial. The Hags are recognized, it's a tough last name. The Hags are recognized nationally and internationally for their expertise as forensic scientists in the area of ballistics, generally shooting recognition and firearms examination. At the time, the preliminary hearing for Baldwin was scheduled to begin on May 3rd, 2023. The special prosecutors could easily have proved successfully to a preliminary hearing on Baldwin's case that even though the forensic testing of the gun was incomplete at that time, the simple fact that Baldwin did not have personal knowledge of the ammunition loaded into the gun, pointed the gun at a person and admitted to detectives that he fired it and was likely it was likely to be enough to surpass the probable cause standard. I think so. It's not a super high standard. However, defense counsel contacted the prosecutor and specifically requested she to consider dismissing the case against Baldwin without prejudice while the forensic testing took place to ensure that Baldwin did not have to bear the expense of paying his numerous elite attorneys to defend him at the preliminary hearing only to later have the case dismissed if the forensic tested, testing indicated the hammer of the gun had been modified. Huh. And you did that. 
the defense was like, so uh, going to prelim is going to be like way expensive for Baldwin with all these like fancy uh, New York attorneys. So could you just like dismiss it so we can like sort this all out and not waste like time and money and and the prosecution was like, sure. That's odd. Underside counsel agreed to dismiss the case without prejudice, pending the outcome of forensic testing and resolution of outstanding discovery issues related to Baldwin's producer contract and other items in possession of Russ Productions, LLC. I'm really surprised the prosecutor was like, yeah, that's fine. Sure. Defense counsel asserted in his motion to dismiss that Baldwin was somehow shocked and surprised by the refiling of the charges against him. Oh, well, that gives a lot of different context. If you ask the prosecutor to dismiss the case without prejudice and say, can we just wait till everything's in and then like have this conversation later? That's, um, that's a much different situation. So defense counsel asserted in his motion that Baldwin was shocked and surprised by the refiling of the charges. This is patently false. Uh, no, no, Baldwin might have still been shocked and surprised. <laughs> he might just not have had reasons to be. This is patently false given the agreement entered into between defense and the undersigned counsel was that the case would be dismissed without prejudice, which means they can refile it kind of whenever, whenever. It was a no low prosequi would be dismissed without prejudice pending the outcome of the forensic testing on the firearm and the no low prosequi filed in the case specifically stated that the investigation was ongoing. It did. Because when I read it, I was like, well, they're, they're definitely leaving the door open to refile. Predictably, the forensic testing concluded that the trigger of the gun had to be pulled for the gun to have discharged on the date that Helena was killed. The alleged modification of the hammer was simply damage caused by the FBI. The FBI? Yeah, when they beat the thing with a mallet. It is worth noting that the damage to the hammer that defense counsel so desperately wants to convince the court was some mysterious modification is damaged specifically to the full cock notch of the hammer and the gun was in the full cock position when the final strike of the FBI's mallet broke the hammer and sear. Because we must restate again that the FBI beat off the cock notch with a mallet. It goes on to say this isn't rocket science. It is the simplest and most plausible explanation. Yeah, the FBI did it. It's worth noting that further testing of the gun in August 2023 revealed, revealed that even with, even when the damage hammer was inserted back, oh God. Did you say placed back into the gun? Was inserted back into the gun and the trigger was replaced. The gun would not remain in the full cock position and the trigger still had to be pulled to drop the hammer after it was caught at the half cock and quarter cock positions. The cocking positions being kind of the safety mechanism there. The defendant simply doesn't have a leg to stand on concerning his claim that the hammer of the gun was modified. He used this false claim to create delay in the prosecution of his case and has now complained in his motion to dismiss the case has been hovering over his head for, or hanging over his head for too long. Upon receiving forensic analysis from Mr. Hag, prosecution was finally able to obtain the video recordings from the filming of Rust, which also clearly demonstrate that the gun was in perfect working condition in every time it was fired by Baldwin. Freeze, motherfucker. Cut, motherfucker. Remember that as he's shooting this gun and they're showing that they're shooting the gun? Um. They show him shooting blanks with that gun just fine, except that he keeps shooting after shooting after cut is called. The videos also confirm the witness statements regarding Baldwin's bullyish behavior on set. And that Mr. Baldwin's producer contract was completely devoid of limitations promised by defense counsel at the April 12th meeting. It was now October, 2023, and the case was, oh, we've gone back to the narrative, and the case was finally ready to be refiled. As disclosed 
in defendant's exhibit four to his motion to dismiss and previously to NBC News. Oh, the shade. Counsel for the state gave Baldwin the opportunity of accepting a very favorable plea. This is an understatement. A very favorable plea agreement rather than have the case proceed to grand jury for a possible indictment. RK said, Ahem, EDB, it's cut, motherfucker. Correct. It was, I, 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 I got the line wrong. Line. Counsel extended this plea offer reluctantly. Well, that's good to know. I want to know, I want to know a lot more about this. But did so with the intention of ensuring that similarly situated defendants do not receive disparate treatment. Mr. Halls was offered a favorable plea, and it seemed only fair to extend a similar offer to Mr. Baldwin prior to proceeding to a grand jury presentment. I have a lot of thoughts about that. Mr. Halls accepted responsibility early. I don't think Mr. Halls and Mr. Baldwin are similarly situated. I think they are all in kind of the zone of, of responsibility. Mr. Halls had so much responsibility for the safety on set, but Baldwin had the gun in his hand. Also, Baldwin didn't accept responsibility early. I don't think there was any obligation to extend a plea offer of any sort to Baldwin, um, but they chose to, and that's fine, but they didn't, they didn't have to. Um, prosecutors are certainly not bound by the philosophical notion that all similarly situated criminal defendants must be treated similarly, but undersigned counsel is not a career prosecutor. At this point, we're aware. Rather, she is a career defense attorney and civil rights lawyer and believes strongly in issues related to fundamental fairness. Fundamental, fundamental fairness is a part of it, but I don't see the defendants as similarly situated given the circumstances, but I also understand I understand the choice made, um, especially if that's what the pro the elected DA would do, because um, some of that is what the office would choose to do, not what this prosecutor would uh, choose to do. Um, sweet and salty, eleven eleven said, "Do we get to see the plea offer offered to Baldwin?" It was elucidated in the last coverage of this, but I think they might also go into it here but they extended the same plea offer that they extended to Halls, which was essentially six months unsupervised probation, a misdemeanor, and like a weapon safety class, and um, uh, uh, testifying honestly if called. That was it. LK in the chat said, this filing sounds like a four hour long YouTube drama channel going off on something. Yes which is the tone of the defense filing as well. The defense filing was like, and here is all the tea. So the prosecution filing is responding in kind. Both of these filings are just spewing all of the information out there, and we're going to look at every single bit of it. Um, Let's see. Undersigned counsels learned some tough lessons about the consequences of her idealistic notions. Ma'am. <laughs> why does this read like a conversation that I have with my therapist? Like, <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to read that again because I'm, I'm really surprised that this is in a pleading. I've, I, 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 I've never, I've never, I've I've never really seen that in a pleading before. <laughs> Drea, <laughs> quoting Clueless, said, he's in his post-adolescent idealistic phase. <sighs> Undersigned counsel has learned some tough lessons about the consequences of her idealistic notions during her dealings with Baldwin's counsel and the series of events that unfolded as a result of the plea offer have been the toughest lessons learned to date. Oh. Uh. I, I, I have, A, I have, I have no words, and B, I have, 
I have questions. I am I am so distracted at the moment. I want to know like what were the idealistic notions? Um what series of events unfolded as a result of the plea offer, offer and what lessons have you learned? I, I um <laughs> Kenna in the chat said, "Ma'am, this is a Wendy's." I Lori and CT said, do you write stuff like this in a filing? I've not, I, I've not seen anything quite like it. Um, oh, we're going to keep going. I want to know what lessons unfold. Maybe this is the, um, the preamble to that, to whoever in the chat said, this reads like a blog post. I, uh, I don't disagree. I'm, I, I don't even think I have the right level of chapstick for this. Hold on. We need a whole, like lip gloss isn't going to do it. We just need a whole, wait, wait, that's all. Where is the, mm. hold on. I need, we need the Laneige. Where is this? This is what we need. I am not ready. <laughs> I'm like, this is a conversation for therapy. But here it is in this motion. I, I am so confused. <laughs> Lyndon said, where is code confusion? Uh, okay. Chat is telling me to keep reading. I'm, I'm trying to process. I, I can't even process what I'm thinking. I'm so dumbfounded that this, that this is where we're at. I want to know the conversation that these defense attorneys had when they got this filing. I also want to ask all of the defense attorneys that I know, like if you're reading that you have caused the special prosecutor to learn some uh, tough lessons as a result of their idealistic notions, do you just like laugh in villain? Or are you just like, <laughs> And I mean, criminal prosecution can be a little bit different, especially in smaller jurisdictions where you work with attorneys regularly. You generally try to work together the best you can. You uh, have a, a different level of collegiality than like civil attorneys. Uh, I learned very, 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 very early on that civil law is a absolute different level of shit show that the you suck emails that start flying the second anything happens are um very very deeply ingrained in the um in the process that the way that the fangs come out with a civil litigation is very different really than um attorneys tend to deal with each other most of the time in criminal prosecutions you generally all try to understand that the um the power of the state is not to be wielded in a a petty and overzealous way that the job of the defense attorney is to provide a zealous defense for their client and you all try to move that process along towards the outcome of finding justice this reads like a civil filing of attorneys that fucking hate each other uh, JB said, I want Bruce Rivers to respond to Emily reading him that sentence. I, I would love to know what Bruce Rivers, the criminal attorney, has to say about the criminal defense attorneys teaching the prosecution the toughest lessons they have learned to date. Okay, we're going to. Um, and Bell asked for the goat. I, I don't know where Vincent Van Gogh went. I'm going to have to ask Griffin. Um, but this is, uh, this is special though. I do think a lot of prosecutors do come in with kind of idealistic notions of how that's going to go. And then they come in and they're like, Oh, everyone hates me. That's, that's delightful. Um, not all the time, but definitely some cases, everyone's just like, stop. I'm going to keep reading chat. We will continue on. 
Hopefully these are the toughest lessons learned. On October 5th, 2023, the special prosecutors extended a plea offer to Mr. Baldwin as confidential and privileged plea negotiations and gave Baldwin until October 27th to accept the offer or the case would proceed to grand jury November 16th. Counsel for the state received no response at all. They didn't email me back. Not even an email from defense counsel stating they received the offer and would discuss it with their client. Okay. They don't have to. Approximately 10 days after the offer was extended and well before the deadline for Mr. Baldwin to accept the offer, undersigned counsel, prosecutor, received information that defense counsel provided all the details of the presumed confidential and privileged plea offer to a reporter with NBC News in New York. After determining that the reporter did indeed have all the details of the plea offer extended to Mr. Baldwin, undersigned counsel received additional information that Baldwin and his counsel were working with the media to generate a campaign designed to deflect attention away from any future plea hearing to protect Baldwin's public image. Well, now I want to know what Molly McPherson has to say about this um, and whether or not this type of a campaign, she's a crisis PR uh, commentator, has a podcast, is on Instagram and TikTok, and has a long, long history in uh, crisis PR. I would love the crisis PR take on whether or not they were using the plea offer to craft a narrative that, see, the prosecution doesn't even believe he's all that culpable because of this deal. It seems that that is at least probable. Like, this doesn't shock me that they would be doing this. None of this shocks me that they would be doing this. Um, that crisis PR would be like, okay, let's let's do this. Counsel received information that Baldwin may accept the plea offer, but intended to file a civil complaint against the state of New Mexico and former prosecutors on the same day as the possible future plea hearing to direct media attention to the frivolous lawsuit and away from the plea hearing. Hmm. What would they have filed? Malicious prosecution? Like, there's there's a whole bunch of immunity that's going to stand in the way of that. As disturbing, as disturbing this information was, is there an as missing? <laughs> a non-mouse in the chat said, I trusted you. I trusted you! As disturbing this information was, undersigned counsel was not inclined to rescind the plea offer simply because Baldwin intended to continue to use the media to escape the consequences of his action, and his counsel had flagrantly disregarded the privileged and confidential nature of plea negotiations. Next, undersigned counsel received information that Mr. Baldwin commissioned his own documentary. Wait, what? No, where's my record scratch? What? Undersigned counsel received information that Baldwin commissioned his own documentary about the death of the woman he killed and was actively pressuring material witnesses in the case against him to submit to interviews for his documentary? How is that not the headline of this motion? Um, excuse me, news media? Baldwin screaming on set isn't the story. This is the story. How are the headlines about this filing that Baldwin was yelling on set? Did all of you not read to page 20? Is this, uh, is this true? <gasps> oh my God. Baldwin commissioned a documentary about the shooting on set and was pressuring witnesses in the case to submit to interviews for the documentary. What? The fuck? Chat, I, granted, granted, granted. 
Motion for Code Red is 100% granted. I don't eat. What in the world is happening? I have Motion for Code Red is granted. For everyone new to stream, first of all, go ahead and do the YouTube things because we really are almost at 750,000 subscribers into my goal of proving to my 12 year old that I am in fact a uh, real YouTuber. So your uh, subscribing helps with that. But also we are granting a motion for code red. Um, for those of you that are new to code red, code red is flashy until the music stops. So if you are flash sensitive, when the music stops, the flashing will also stop. So I give you a heads up so that you can, um, you can uh, turn away from the screen appropriately while the music plays during code red and we are going to code red in three two one code red is our defcon what the fuck level and we have officially reached what the fuck levels on page 20 of the state's filing which alleges that Baldwin commissioned a documentary about the death of the woman he killed and was actively pressuring material witnesses in the case against him to submit to interviews for his documentary. Oh my God. The prosecution goes on to say it was at this point that the plea offer was rescinded and the case was scheduled for grand jury and still Mr. Baldwin complains to this court that he has been treated unfairly. It is worth noting that after the plea offer was rescinded, the NBC News reporter again contacted the prosecution and warned her that she, reporter, spoke to defense counsel about the retraction of the plea and that counsel exclaimed that he was going to destroy undersigned counsel. I mean, lawyerly hyperbole. I can... Mm. <sighs> Undersigned counsel responded that she expected nothing less. I mean, at this point, you, you know what we haven't seen yet? Really, is a hearing with all of these lawyers. And um, we've definitely seen Prosecutor Morrissey bring the snark in court. the way i will be running to this hearing when it happens because the amount of mudslinging is absolutely bananas in response to mr baldwin's assertions that i i don't even know where we are i don't even know where we are in arguing the motion to dismiss i'm i'm so wrapped in the blog post of like let me tell you what actually went down. Like, I'm here for the retelling of, of all of the tea being spilled. I, I've lost where we're at in the legal motion. I have no idea, no idea what point has been made as to how the prosecution didn't violate their duties the way that the defense said that they, they did. Um, uh, I, um, I, I'm uh, on the legal motion. I'm lost. Molly W in the chat said, we're now reading a burn book. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm lost. They reported on the documentary in April last year. She's dark inside. We're going to have to look. I'm, I had not heard that at all. Um, okay. Let's keep reading. What? Someone needs to start subpoenaing whatever is going on in that documentary if they haven't already. In response to Baldwin's assertions that the state's counsel engaged in inappropriate contact with the media, that's what they're responding to. Good, good. And somehow disadvantaged him by removing the language related to the 48-hour deadline from his target notice. The prosecutor incorporates herein all arguments set forth in the state's attached Exhibit E, State's counsel further asserts that, oh, oh, Your Honor, we've attached our arguments. Uh, let us finish spilling the tea. And then 
the arguments are just attached. Like the, like the rest of it's just down below. Stina G said this really is an EDB first look. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I tell you when it's a first look or when it's not. I told you we're going through this line by line because um, documentary, documentary. Now I know what um, now I know what I'm going to be looking for in this trial is that footage. No. Oh. <sighs> what do you think Baldwin's purpose of the documentary was like? But this is why I'm right, or this is why I didn't do it, or. You know, what's the name of O.J. Simpson's book? Um, or is it like this is what needs to happen in the industry to make sure this didn't happen? Mm. Katrina said, I researched your video about the settlement like two days ago and you mentioned the doc. Did I? Did I already forget? Sometimes ADHD is a gift and I get to experience for the things for the first time more than once. Um <laughs> Yes. Wait, if I did it, um, it's damning footage either way. Um, I, I would imagine that if he's trying to talk to witnesses, that needs to come up when those witnesses testify. I don't remember a doc being mentioned. It might've, I might've had the same reaction then and have forgotten again, ADHD is a gift. I can be uh, shocked all over again. My husband doesn't find it so much of a gift. He's like, I told you that. I'm like, you did? Because it's new to me, even if it's not new to me. All right. Um, right. Let's see. States like, go back and CEG, other arguments about that. State council, states council further asserts that she had not removed the language related to the 48-hour deadline from the target notice and then proceeded to request a modification the defendant would have complied that he or complained that he was mistreated by being provided and 48 hour deadline and then having the state mention or motion the court to modify the deadline. Baldwin wasn't disadvantaged. He was he wasn't treated unfairly. The state never requested that his time to respond be shortened to anything less than what the rule contemplated. But where's the argument against the rest of what they allege? The reasons for requesting a modification of the deadline were to ensure that the court would have ample time to address the legal issues raised by the defendant's anticipated alert letter and the state could timely accommodate the travel arrangements for out-of-state witnesses scheduled to appear before the grand jury. In the end, state's counsel was right. There was not ample time for the court to address defendant's argument and the court vacated the grand jury presentation for November 16th, thus demonstrating that the state's request for a scheduling order was not at all frivolous. See exhibities. In his motion to dismiss, oh, now we're, what page are we on? 22? We're now. <laughs> Remember that motion to dismiss. Let's get back there. In his motion to dismiss, Baldwin complained about counsel's contact with an NBC reporter on November 15th. In truth, the sole reason, girl, tell us your side of it. The sole reason undersigned counsel had any contact with the reporter is because Baldwin's counsel released to NBC News all videos from the filming of Russ that they had requested be provided to the grand jury as exhibits in their grand jury alert letter. Really? NBC, are you holding out on us? Where are the videos? Defense counsel released the videos to NBC the night before the grand jury was scheduled to convene and modified the videos to show their client in a more favorable light. Did you give them to TMZ? TMZ would have played them by now. Undersigned counsel did not provide the grand jury uh, date to anyone other than the witnesses being called before the grand jury and instructed those witnesses not to disclose it to anyone else. Undersigned counsel did not yell at the reporter from NBC News, nor did she threaten her with a subpoena. I want to hear what the reporter from NBC has to say about that. I feel like the truth in that might lie somewhere in the middle. Underside counsel explained her contact with the NBC News reporter in detail. That, that said, there are times where I feel like this prosecutor's yelling at me when I'm just watching the hearings. 
<laughs> so the perception of of Miss Morrissey saying, I'm not yelling at her, and the NBC reporter being like, but I feel yelled at, um, both of them might be, both of them might be uh telling the truth here because there are times during the trial I've been like, uh, please don't yell at me. Under saying, she's like, you've not seen me yell. That was moderate snark. KT Lady says she speaks up her case fluently. Undersigned counsel did not yell at the reporter from NBC News, nor did she threaten her with a subpoena. She might have said, then I'll subpoena you. It might have felt like a threat to the reporter. Anyway, undersigned counsel explained her contact with the NBC News reporter in detail during the grand jury litigation and has attached those pleadings for the court's review. Oh, boy. Um, B2, I have to take a moment and thank you um, for the gifted memberships. Y'all... B2 made it rain memberships in the chat. Thank you for the 50 gifted memberships. For all of you new members, we have a members only live tomorrow. So um, thank you. For everyone else who has gifted memberships, do not worry. We will be swooping through those as we get to um, as we get to questions. But B2, that's incredibly generous. Thank you so much. And to all the new members, welcome. Good luck. And those are distributed by uh, the YouTube at random. And there is a members only live tomorrow. So um you'll you'll get to you'll get to come and join the fun um in the members only live. And if you haven't seen the Ringo video that I've been talking about, uh, that's in the member space. You can go watch that after this. Let's see. Uh that's exhibit E. So we need to go to D and E. Emily, how long are we streaming for today? All the meat of of defense counsel's arguments. Emily, no, read it properly. You can't say cock 17,000 times in a motion and then get to defense counsel's meat, ma'am. The crux, the weight. The meat, the meat of defense counsel's arguments relate to the presentation of the charges to the grand jury and demonstrate a fundamental ignorance on the part of defense counsel, ma'am. <laughs> Oh dear. Oh, oh, this is, this trial is, is going to be so rife with these attorneys snapping at each other in a different way. But, um, so she's saying the defense's arguments demonstrate a fundamental ignorance on the part of defense counsel with regard to the law. <laughs> Ignorant of the law is not, is, uh, yikes. As it relates to grand jury proceedings in the state of New Mexico. Sir, you're from New York. You don't even go here, WTF. First, the presenting prosecutor is not required to notify the grand jurors of their ability to subpoena witnesses or documents. This is the purview of the court. I was saying that during my coverage of this. I said, I want to know what the court tells the grand jurors they can do. The grand jurors don't walk off the street and sit down in the grand jury room with no information about their powers. The grand jurors go through a formal orientation where they are verbally notified of their ability to subpoena witnesses and evidence and are provided with a written packet that instructs them on their powers. Is it called? the power i have the power the power of you the power of us the power of the grand jury what's the name of the packet the written instructions provide the grand jury by the court clearly state quote the presiding judge of the grand jury will guide you to assure that your actions are within the authority conferred upon you by law any grand juror may at any time with propriety seek advice and guidance from the judge as to the scope and propriety of the grand jury's acts and investigations. Just ask. It should be the power of grace. The grand jury has the power to order the attendance of witnesses and to cause the production of public and private records or other evidence relative and relevant to its investigation. It has the authority of the court to subpoena witnesses 
and obtain execution of subpoenas. You want something? Ask. Defense counsel is correct that the court ultimately ordered the state to make nearly all of the defendants requested evidence and witnesses available to the grand jury by way of an alert letter, and the state did exactly as instructed, and Mr. Baldwin was subsequently indicted. They read it to the grand jury. And that's that's what the defense said too. They read it to the grand jury. The state is arguing that they went beyond what is required of prosecutors presenting alert letters to the grand jury. Not only did the state read every word of Baldwin's alert letter to the grand jury, but the state provided each and every juror with their own copy of the letter. Here you go. This is this is what he says is there. If y'all want any of it, let us know. You can call the witnesses. Even though the alert letter provided to every grand juror detailed the documents of Baldwin's request, um, detailed the documents Mr. Baldwin requested the grand jury consider, the state had copies of each and every document for the grand juror in the room. There were three banker's boxes of documents sitting in the room and at the conclusion of the evidence, underside counsel notified the grand jurors that copies of all of Mr. Baldwin's requested documents were available for their review should they wish to, wish to see them. If that is true, how did the defense leave this out of their motion? It's just completely misleading if that was the case. How do you leave that part of the transcript out when you're arguing to the court? They argued to the court with their whole chest that the prosecution did not make available the documents and witnesses requested. And the prosecutor's like, um, actually, no. That's a... Uh... That's a, that's a little bit outside for me of just arguing when you actually argue that they didn't do a thing that they are saying they did. That's, uh, oh. I'm interested to see what the reply is, but this is not great. The truth is that the grand jurors were alerted to Baldwin's witnesses and documents. They had no interest in reading the documents or requesting the attendance of witnesses. This is typical of grand jury proceedings where the target does not testify, as is his right. The state provided Baldwin's requested proximate cause instructions, read the instructions to the grand jury verbatim, included the instructions in the packet of instructions that the grand jurors were required to consider. Baldwin complained in his motion that the state didn't take enough time to present the case to the grand jury and rushed through the presentation. This assertion is absolutely false and another attempt by Baldwin to receive special treatment. Yeah, grand jurors don't have to be long or strong or down to get the friction on. They, I mean, they get to choose. The state spent one and one half days presenting this case to the grand jury. This is an unprecedented amount of time to spend presenting any case to a grand jury, let alone a fourth degree felony. They're like, um, this is a case that gets presented in like a few hours. The Baldwin grand jury presentation was likely one of the longest in New Mexico history. Ma'am, you're, did you ask the other prosecutors? Okay, and almost certainly one of the longest in the history of the first judicial district court. The grand jury presentation was unusually long because there was a great deal of evidence, witnesses, and exculpatory material that needed to be presented. Upon reading the laughable assertion, oh, yikes. Upon reading the laughable assertion that one and one half days was not long enough, undersigned counsel gathered information from the prosecutors in the second judicial district, which is considerably greater in population and crime rates than the first. She spoke to two prosecutors who routinely indict and prosecute capital murders, child abuse resulting in death, other cases of serious criminal behavior. And the longest grand jury presented they have ever participated in lasted no longer than three hours. That does not surprise me. Um, I've had friends do grand jury cases that are less than a day on like 
no body murder cases. Excuse me, Your Honor. We did the longest grand jury in the history of the world. And he's still bitching about it. Tell him to sit down. <sighs> Defense counsel complained in his motion that the prosecution rushed through the grand jury process and should have postponed the grand jury presentation and simultaneously complained that the charges have been hovering over Baldwin's head for far too long. Baldwin does not like the stress, Your Honor. There is simply no pleasing Mr. Baldwin or his counsel. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> oh, my God. As proof, Judge Ellington granted nearly all of Mr. Baldwin's pre-grand jury requests, and after the indictment was filed, the criminal case was assigned to Judge Ellington for trial court proceedings. Oh, really? How did Mr. Baldwin respond? By excusing the judge who granted nearly all of his pre-jury requests. C states attached exhibit H. We've got to look at that one too. He, he papered the judge. Really? He papered the judge. Why would the defense excuse a judge who seemingly bent over backwards to accommodate his countless requests? Oh, here comes the speculation. When you start with probably we've like jumped the shark in this argument, but I'm here for all of it probably because Judge Ellington denied his request for a modification to the uniform jury instruction that was absolutely contrary to New Mexico law and failed to act on his frivolous motion for sanctions against the special prosecutors. <laughs> Ma'am. A cursory review of the allegations contained in his motion to dismiss demonstrate that defense counsel misled the court at nearly every turn in his publicly filed pleading. I mean, I'm glad they're publicly filed, aren't you? On page 21 of his motion, he stated, quote, Hag omitted, he's not talking about the prosecution for anyone who's just come in. He's not, he's talking about the weapons expert. Hag omitted several essential facts regarding the testing. We argued about this when we read it because we had watched the trial, including that the FBI testing established that the gun did fire without a trigger pull when the firearm was fully loaded with six rounds as it was on the day of the incident. The prosecution says, false. On the day of the incident, the gun was fired from a full cock position. Okay. During FBI testing, the gun only fired without a trigger pull when the hammer was in the resting position as it is designed to do if a cartridge is loaded into the chamber of the cylinder that aligns with the firing pin. This is also from the defense motion, quote, Hag admitted that the hammer of the firearm that fired the fatal round was quote unquote rounded, which would make it easier to fire. False. Oh, she's turned into Dwight Schrute. False. Bears. Beats. Battlestar Galactica. Okay, false. There is simply no evidence that... I had to finish. Identity theft is a very serious crime, Jim. Okay, I swear I'm done. There is simply no evidence that the hammer was in anything other than the perfect condition at the the most perfect hammer to ever hammer. At the time the gun fired the fatal round into Ms. Hutchins' body, and if defense counsel doesn't believe Mr. Hag or counsel for the state, then perhaps he is willing to believe his own client, oh, shit, who told OSHA investigators that there was nothing wrong with the gun. The only problem was that it had a live round in it. On page 25, counsel argued that Mr. Carpenter, quote, told the grand jury that the safety bulletins issued by SAG place responsibility for firearm safety on the actor and asserted that the statement is false when in fact the statement is true. What? General Code of Safety Practices, SAG, Section 11, Firearms and Other Weapons, quote, this is going to be the crux of this case. Treat all weapons as though they are loaded and or ready to use. Never point one at anyone, including yourself. The same language is found in SAG Safety Bulletin Number 1, firearms, along with the following statement. Never place your finger on the trigger until you are ready to shoot. Q 
Keep your finger alongside the firearm until you are ready to shoot. Know where and what your intended target is. These are these are these are the firearm rules of safety. But checking the, the there is a splitting of hairs in this. I'm sure you see it. The defense is arguing that responsibility for firearm safety being on the actor seems to insinuate that checking the gun, loading the gun is on the actor. When the prosecution is arguing on the other side of that, that everyone in the chain of custody with the weapon is responsible for weapon safety and the actor responsibility for weapon safety includes don't point it at someone, don't pull the trigger until you're ready to shoot, know your target. So different levels of what is meant by firearm safety. These are the rules for actors handling firearms on movie sets and Mr. Baldwin managed to disregard every single one of them. Defense counsel is incredibly articulate and very persuasive, but he is certainly not devoted to truth telling. Oh shit. Ma'am. Calling defense counsel a liar is not going to make this any better. Sardinisms said this really feels like a civil suit, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Defense counsel demonstrated his ignorance of the rules. As, she's called this defense attorney ignorant like seven times. Defense counsel demonstrated his ignorance of the rules as, of evidence as they pretend to grand jury proceedings and criticized the state for presenting its investigator, Connor Rice, to testify as to hearsay related to the investigation and the incident. That's permitted, even if the defense doesn't like it. Defense counsel accused the state of redirecting the grand jury's inquiries to witnesses in an attempt to disadvantage Baldwin when, in fact, the state deferred the grand jury's questions on a couple of occasions because the grand jurors were asking questions of witnesses who are not qualified to answer them. I mean, we did watch Prosecutor Morrissey expand the scope of what witnesses could testify about in the trial of Hannah Gutierrez. We talked about it, but the defense didn't object. So while we were sitting here going, um, that feels like it's maybe outside the scope of what this witness can testify to, she just kept on, kept on keeping on. That's not going to happen in this trial. There's going to be an objection like every 30 seconds in this trial. This is, mm, this is going to be different. <clears throat> yeah, the shade is not even like subtle lawyer shade. This is just direct shade. It says the state purposefully called witnesses back to the stand after their testimony was complete so the grand jury could have their questions answered completely and by the most qualified witness. For example, on page 30 of his motion, counsel pointed out that when a grand juror asked Detective Hancock a detailed question about the protocols for gun safety on movie sets, the state asked the expert movie set armor to address the question rather than the law enforcement officer who has never worked a day on a film set. This conduct was appropriate and designed to ensure the grand jury received the most reliable information available. Defense argued that the grand jury never heard from Joel Souza, Ryan Smith, Dave Halls, or Sarah Zachary as a result of the prosecution's diversions. In fact, the grand jury did not hear from these witnesses because they choose not to order the state to produce them after being alerted to every word of Baldwin's alert letter and being fully aware of their powers to compel testimony. It's worth noting that only one of these witnesses has been disclosed by the defendant in accordance with the rules. Oh, so they're not even all on the defense witness list. Interesting. For all of defense attorney's complaints about the way the grand jury presentation was handled, he failed to remark on the fact that the state spent a large amount of time during the presentation demonstrating that Gutierrez was the source of the live rounds found on set. Gutierrez was the person who loaded the live round into the gun, and Mr. Baldwin had no reason to believe that there was a live round in the gun given that he operated... Why is that sentence weird? Baldwin had no reason to believe that there was a live round in the gun given that he opted to forego the industry standard safety protocols 
available to him and did so at his own risk and at the risk of those around him. It's just kind of awkward. Baldwin's failure to exercise his option to simply observe the armor or load the dummy rounds in the gun and visually and or audibly demonstrate to the actor that the rounds are safe and dummy rounds was not a violation of SAG safety bulletins, but it was a violation of New Mexico law. New Mexico law prohibits the negligent use of firearms, and this is actually contemplated in the SAG safety bulletins. On at least four separate occasions, the guidelines and safety bulletins state, quote, these guidelines are recommended by the industry-wide labor management safety committee and should not be considered binding laws or regulations. However, state, federal, and or local regulations apply and would override the guidelines. Look, if you just didn't point it at somebody and pulled the trigger while it was fully cocked, there wouldn't be a negligent handling of the firearm. We're on page 29. But I'm I'm glad to see the 10,000 of you here, and I am happy to report that we are getting closer to 750,000 subs. So you guys, if you're new, we do this here. Just... All right. Defense counsel complained on... <laughs> Your Honor, he's whining. Defense counsel complained on page 35, paragraph C of his motion, that the special prosecutors issued an improper and prejudicial jury instruction to the grand jury. Well, I'm glad that almost 30 pages in, we've gotten to the thing that might actually be a problem, which is reading the jury instruction wrong. That is the real issue in all of this, as I see it. The prosecution says this is patently false. The prosecutors did not deviate from UG 14-231. Not ooh woo, UG. We simply filed, oh, sorry. We simply filled in the language that was required to be filled in and did so in accordance with the instruction and facts presented to the grand jury. Counsel would like the instruction provided to the grand jury to read one, the target discharged a firearm during the production of a movie. Two, the target should have known the danger involved from the target's actions. This argument is ridiculous. Tell me why. The reason Baldwin's behavior was in violation of the law is because he pointed a gun at a person, cocked it, and pulled the trigger, having no personal knowledge of what type of ammunition was in the gun. This is a violation of basic gun safety and New Mexico law. There is a fundamental difference between a gun handler not having personal knowledge of the ammunition in the gun and pointing it as a person, cocking it and pulling the trigger, and having subjective knowledge that there is a live round in the gun, pointing it at a person, cocking it and pulling a trigger. Well, if the second were true, you'd be charged with like murder. The first is in that involuntary manslaughter. Uh, if I kept reading, I bet she's going to say that. The difference is that the first satisfies the elements of involuntary manslaughter, a fourth degree felony. The second is second degree murder and or depraved mind murder, first degree murder. Yeah, if you know a gun's loaded with a bullet, point it at somebody and fire it volitionally, you're in the realm of murder, not involuntary manslaughter. Mr. Baldwin had a duty to confirm that only inert ammunition had been placed in the gun before pointing it at a person, cocking it and pulling the trigger as the gun handler in the state of New Mexico, subject to New Mexico laws. His failure to do so resulted in negligent homicide as long as the other elements of the crime are satisfied. That's the argument I thought they were going to focus on. I'm glad to see they're focusing on it. Judge Ellington's January 11th order provided as defendants exhibit 11, contradicts Baldwin's assertions and arguments to the court. Judge Ellington's order required the state to alert the grand jury to the existence of the following witnesses and their potential testimony via the target's grand jury evidence alert letter, which they read out loud. This was done verbally and in writing to every grand juror in the room. I think that meets the element. In paragraph 11BI, Ellington ordered the state to alert the grand jury to the existence of documents 1 through 8, 10, and 12 through 14 via 
the letter, which was done verbally and in writing. In paragraph 11CI, the state was ordered to actually present documents 9 and, and 11 and did so. The jury did not elect to hear from Baldwin's witnesses, and if they had elected to hear from him, they would have presented in person virtually after seeking and obtaining approval from the court or via video recorded statements they previously provided to law enforcement. The grand jury did not elect to hear from Baldwin's witnesses, and therefore no scheduling disruptions were encountered. Um, let's see. Judge Ellington cited to the state versus Herrera, quote, once alerted to target, I, I can't believe we're 30 pages in and finally getting to the legal argument. It was like 27 pages of shade. And now we're now we're addressing the legal argument. <sighs> Christ almighty. Okay. Once alerted to target offered evidence, the grand jury remains free to decide not to hear the evidence or to hear the evidence and weigh it as it sees fit. They get to choose. The state followed Judge Ellington's order. Oh my God, we're done. Holy shit. <laughs> Long on shade, short on legal arguments. The state followed Judge Ellington's order to the letter and Baldwin was indicted. The state asked the court to deny the motion to dismiss. I ask for oral argument. That's what I ask. Which judge is this in front of? Because I've already forgotten. Hold on. Let's see if we can get to the get to the top of this motion quickly. Um, who is this in front of? No, that's the clerk. Mm. I'm gonna have to look because now I'm. Now I'm wondering if this just went back to the judge that has the other case or not. I'm going to have to take, I'm going to have to double check. Hold on. Let's go to the sidebar real quick because we need to get to the exhibities and we need to get past. So exhibit A is not one we're going through. This is the transcript of Baldwin's interview with the detectives, which I've covered in other content and is available on the internet. You guys can go watch it here on YouTube um, and elsewhere, but I broke that down in, a, I believe, a podcast episode. Let's see if we can get to Exhibit B, which is the transcript of the interview with Stephanopoulos, which I broke down on the podcast. So we're going to zoom, zoom past that one. We are, let's see, Exhibit C is the transcript of what transcript of interview of alec baldwin from audio recording for osha um i don't think we're going to go into the osha hearing we're going to get to exhibit d and then we'll have to get to the videos runkle so helpfully provided us of baldwin's weapons training as we get to the end of this let's see so that's the osha interview states exhibit d here we go. Of course it is. I feel lied to. This is the state's response to the motion for sanctions against special prosecutors Carrie Morrissey and Jason Lewis from December 6, 2023. Oh, boy. ABQ Cat said it's Judge Summer again, same as HG. I thought so. Um, we are, we're bringing the D. It's time for the D. It is time for the D. We are getting to the D. Not the D you were expecting. Carla, no, it was not the D I was expecting. I didn't know that what we were getting to was the prosecution's response to the motion for sanctions. We had only read the motion for sanctions because it was attached as an exhibit to the defense's motion. So now the prosecution is like, I'm going to throw the D down and give you our response to the motion for sanctions. How long is this motion for sanctions, ma'am? Apologies to everyone who can't look at this scrolling. Wait, how, oh, how many pages is this? Ma'am, 19 pages. Let's see how well we can summarize Exhibit D. 
Yikes. <sighs> okay. Let's let's go for it, chat. We're in it now. Like we're in it to win it today. Well, let's take a look at the state's response, shall we? Comes now. <laughs> in exhibit D. <laughs> Comes now. Morrissey and Lewis responding to targets. This is before he's indicted. Targets motion for sanctions. One, in his motions for sanctions, defense counsel claims special prosecutor released information that the court vacated the grand jury seating and reset it to a later date so it could address outstanding legal issues and did this within an hour of the conclusion of the November 15th hearing. Defense counsel is mistaken. Undersigned counsel did not wait an hour after the hearing to disclose the information. She disclosed it within minutes of the conclusion of the hearing, although not to the media. Okay. As the court noted at the beginning of the November 15th hearing, undersigned had numerous witnesses scheduled to appear to give testimony before the grand jury on November 16th, some of whom were traveling from out of state. Prosecution notified the witnesses immediately after the hearing to the grand jury setting on November 16th being vacated. Further notified witnesses it was rescheduled to the 18th so they can make appropriate changes to their schedules. Making these changes likely requested witnesses to notify spouses, children, employers, et cetera. When asked why the grand jury was being vacated with such little notice, counsel explained to the witnesses there were outstanding legal issues that needed to be addressed by the court, which was the truth. There is nothing sanctionable about this conduct. I mean, did you go and talk to NBC though? In fact, the undersigned counsel went further than the court order and instructed all witnesses not to disclose the January grand jury date in order to avoid it becoming public. The comments defense counsel complains of can absolutely be attributed to undersigned counsel as she had to notify her witnesses of the status of the grand jury proceeding. The case against Baldwin garnered a great deal of press coverage and is largely outside the control of the prosecution in the court. The state, by current or previous prosecutors, has not prejudiced, has not pursued a prejudicial media campaign against Baldwin. In January 2023, the state issued a press release that did not violate the uh, RPCs and was issued subsequent to numerous public statements by Mr. Baldwin and Ms. Gutierrez's lawyers. Like Ms. Gutierrez's counsel, Mr. Baldwin and his counsel have consistently used the press to disseminate detailed information about the case. I mean, the prosecution has also talked to the media. The prosecution has been like, we're going to do a thing. And then three days later, they're like, we're still going to do a thing. And then like a week later, they do the thing. This pissing over who's talking to the media more is just tiresome. Oh, Baldwin appeared in a highly televised interview. What's highly televised? Is there lowly televised? What's the opposite of highly televised? It was televised. Highly viewed? I, I don't, okay. In a highly televised interview with his personal friend, George Stephanopoulos, and gave a detailed interview about the tragedy and denied all culpability. Go watch for yourself what you think. It's available. Widely viewed? Yep. Exactly. Um... This is all in the last motion. On August 19th, Baldwin again used his celebrity status to sway public opinion concerning the details of the investigation with an interview on CNN. This was in the last motion. Baldwin did this after the interview with Hannah Gutierrez by Sheriff's Detectives on November 9th, where Ms. Gutierrez acknowledged that she personally provided, albeit unknowingly, the box of dummy rounds that contained the live rounds, not Mr. Kinney. As a result of the misleading statements made by Baldwin and Gutierrez's lawyers concerning the origin of the live rounds, Kinney's lucrative business supplying props to Western genre films and television shows was destroyed. A consequence that likely has not crossed Baldwin's mind. I mean, uh, prosecutors, it's not really your job to protect Seth Kinney's business. Baldwin... Further up the motion, Baldwin, they say, accused Kinney of commingling the rounds, even though it was Gutierrez. 
it's not the prosecution's business. Like Kinney needs his own lawyer, but it's not the prosecution's business to defend Seth Kinney. Truly. The Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department made available to the public all the evidence related to its investigation on April 25th by making a link to the evidence available for download. Uh, I mean, Kinney's lawyer can put out a statement correcting it. They talk about the CNN um, interview. Let's see. As recently as October 31st, 2023, a podcast by Kelly Ripa. Does Kelly Ripa have a podcast? Aired concerning Baldwin's new reality television show. What? Mr. Baldwin made time during the interview that had nothing to do with the ongoing criminal proceedings to comment about the status of the case. Alec Baldwin eight is enough on the podcast. Wait a second. I need to, I need to Google. Uh, like, is he calling it eight or eight is enough? Is he, are they the new John and Kate plus eight? Is Alec Baldwin doing a reality show? This is coming from parade. The actor doesn't have a reality show in the works, but he once said on Kelly Ripa's Let's Talk Off Camera podcast that he and wife have considered doing a reality show so they can work from home in New York. They've even gone so far as to pitch ideas. Again, this is coming from Parade. Um, let's see. It looks like shows about their family. He said... Um, Baldwin admitted on the podcast that he kind of craves a private life. After discussing the tragic Russ shooting incident, he said, quote, now at my age when that happened, I really do think about, you know, I've kind of had enough. I mean, I've done this for a long time and I want to have a private life. I don't want my kids to be influenced by any of that or spattered by any of that. And so not working, I've been working less and less and less. And I'm home and my wife and I, we want to travel the world with the kids. I mean, I want to show seven kids Rome and London and Paris and Madrid and blah, 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 blah. That is the direct quote. It says blah, 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 three times. Blah, blah, blah. I'm not saying that Baldwin is a vampire. I'm just, I'm just saying he does say blah, blah, blah. I'm just saying. This continues from the Parade.com article saying, well, like all reality show, Baldwin's potential series would in theory be about his life, including his very large brood with yogi wife, Hilaria Baldwin, who's no stranger to controversy. And then it has a link to that. The Emmy Award, the Emmy winner and Hilaria who wed in 2012 share seven kids. Um, it also mentions his 28-year-old daughter, Ireland. Hilaria has previously spoken to E! News about embracing the chaos of raving se raising seven kids. I feel like one and two, I was more trying to hold the chaos and by three, they outnumber you. Although Alec confirmed he didn't plan on having any more children, his family grew in 2023 with the arrival of his daughter, Ireland, and her boyfriend's first child, Holland. So he is also a grandfather. Um, so the show has not been greenlit. It seems in theory that they had been pitching ideas about a family show. Um, an article from People on November 8th, as we sidetrack from what we're covering. Hold on. We're going to switch our screen share real quick to this one. <laughs> Hold on, because now I am fascinated. A source tells people that Alec and Hilaria Baldwin would only do reality TV if it was an authentic portrayal of who they are. I I don't know if that's what Hillary wants. Um... Uh, uh, Okay, this is from November 8th, 2023. The world could be keeping up with the Baldwin 
bunch very soon. A source tells people that Alec and his wife are pitching a family reality show that would give an inside look at their life. Are you going to call it like eight kids and counting, seven kids and counting? Alec and Hilaria plus eight. Like what, what are we calling it? I feel like this has been done and that this is a, uh, this is uh, okay. A source tells Alec Baldwin, a source tells people that Alec and his wife are pitching a family reality show that would give an inside look at their life with their seven children. Um, They're excited, but would only do it if it was an authentic portrayal of who they are as a family. The kids all have such fun personalities and Hilaria and Alec know how much interest there is in their lives. The source adds that Alec 65 and Hilaria 39 both, quote, like the idea of giving people a behind the scenes look at raising a big family. I will say that the thing that stands out to me most in this photo is that I freaking love that Dyson cordless vacuum that they have. It is one of my favorite things. The the Dyson cordless vacuums, they often have them at Costco, are so freaking good. They're just clutch. They're absolutely just clutch. You guys are naming it nine passengers. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, the Dyson's so good. The Dyson's so good. It's, it's, I love it. They're amazing. Love it. They're amazing. Um, the first thing I saw in this photo, I was like, Ooh, <laughs> that's the, uh, that's the, that's the, the vacuum that I love. But, um, I, I would say that if they wanted to do this, they would probably just start a YouTube channel, right? Like do you really need a green light a show? Not that, not, I'm not even going to get into family vlogging. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about that another day, but if this is what Hilaria wants to do, just, just, uh, just on YouTube. um, it probably is very, I mean, it probably is staged. <laughs> I love pie says Emily ignores the thousand kids. Ooh, a vacuum. Uh-huh. 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 I, lo I love the Dysons so much and I love them because they're not super loud, which um, this is not an ad for Dyson and it is not sponsored, but they're not super loud, which is one of the things that that bothers me about vacuuming in the first place is how loud they can be. Okay. The possibility of a Baldwin family reality series first emerged on Sirius XM's Let's Talk Off Camera podcast when Alec told host Kelly Ripa that they were considering pitches due to the pair's large brood. First of all, who refers to their family as a brood? Is it, uh, um, I don't know why, it just, eh. everything's about my family, he said. I have really tried in the last several years. Once we had five and then six and then seven, I can't go anywhere for any length of time, he explained. Um, Sir? Have you met having children? <laughs> like, in the old days, I'd jump on a plane and go to LA. It was easy to pick up and go. I need it. I need 12 plane tickets, nannies, kids, my wife. I need like 11. They don't even have 11 seats in business class section of a plane. Oh my God, this gets worse. I'm so glad that we, I'm so glad that we took this detour. <laughs> the fucking horror. The horror. They don't even have 11 seats in the business class section of the plane. <laughs> it's so hard i need 12 plane tickets you have wait there are seven kids so two nannies nannies kids wife i need like 11 um Dude, the Kardashians fly private. Like, I don't understand what the problem is. I'm waiting for the prosecutor to be like, look, Baldwin can't do anything. There's not enough seats in business class. I don't, I don't know what you want. 
the it's complicated acted noted that everything he does is filtered through the idea of my family not the actuality just the thought of family like what would it look like if i did this because of my family the jobs i take jobs i don't take someone said a famous tv producer who i won't name said to me wait this is the strangest fucking quote ever so someone told you what a producer said to you somebody said oh he's he's sidetracking sorry a famous tv producer who i won't name said to me come to a series with me in vancouver and i was like i'm not going to vancouver for five months that's not happening but have you had all dressed chips they're really nice um just saying so everything we do everything we did and then shows we have considered and pitches we've heard and even one or two pitches we've made about our family and that reality show has all been so we could stay home and just work from home i'm desperate to try to work from new york okay well i figured out how to work from home and have kids it just sometimes you can just do that alec and hilaria have been married since 2012 i don't need to get into any more of that oh that's the end of the article fantastic we can get back to the legal filings and now we're all aware that there just aren't enough there aren't enough seats in business class for um for baldwin to tra to travel okay okay that was uh that was delightful <laughs> should we get back should we get back to the the filing should we get back to the filing um three hours in um wait i'm sorry i just got sent a, another article that we that we need to address from in touch migalina and chris thank you this is from april 9th 2024 i'm sorry what day is it today Today is April 9th, 2024 from 11.58 a.m. Wait a second. I don't cover breaking news, but this we're covering. This is on the subject of reality TV. We just, give me a minute. We're pulling this up immediately. So, this is a story coming to us from today from In Touch. Uh, wait, I think that's who it's coming to us from. In Touch Weekly. I can't. I can't. I can't. Hilaria Baldwin met with Real Housewives of Beverly Hills execs about joining the show. Of course. I did forget to make the lights green. But they live in New York. The Real Housewives of New York are like, we could never. Like, we could never. Oh, my God. So I guess they're moving to Los Angeles. Hilaria is already setting herself up for a life without her husband, Alec Baldwin. That's a big statement. Who was charged? I, I mean, we're going to have to go to read her version. Mm. Wait, how do we get to the reader version? Damn it. This is awful. We can't go to the reader version. Hilaria is already setting herself up for life without her husband, Alec Baldwin, who was charged with involuntary manslaughter after the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins on the set of Rust. Sources tell in touch Hilaria's shilling herself as the next real housewife of Beverly Hills. Bravo Lubs, I promise I won't I won't share your info. Those of you who uh already DM me, I need I need any of you that know anything about this to let me know. I need I have questions. The 40-year-old yoga instructor who what age did they quote her at the other article? Either way, the 40-year-old yoga instructor who lives with the Oscar nominated actor in New York was spotted hauling their Jesus that's some language, hauling their seven kids around Los Angeles, where our sources say she met with Real Housewives of Beverly Hills execs about joining the Bravo hit. And her pal Kyle Richards, who currently stars on the show, is apparently pulling for her. 
When asked who would be a good choice to replace recently fired cast member Anne Marie, Richards coyly teased, she lives in New York, but maybe she would move. I mean, that show loves a legal drama. Do you think, do you think Erica Girardi would be just like, yes, please, someone else's legal drama? Last year, both Hilaria and Alex 66 were floating the idea of doing a reality series based on their family, but that was before he got word he's going to be retried. Well, no, there's a lot of reasons why that word was wrong. We're not doing that. Emily, keep going. For involuntary manslaughter of Russ cinematographer Hutchins, who was killed when a gun the actor was holding discharged on the New Mexico set. There, There's a lot wrong in this sentence, um, but that was before he was reindicted for shooting Helena Hutchins, shooting and killing Helena Hutchins. With the possibility Alec could be locked up, Hilaria is said to want a gig that would keep her in the celebrity spotlight and take her and the kids to the West Coast. Hilaria is terrified of losing all the attention she's gained as the wife of a Hollywood star if he's away in prison, said the insider. This would be a perfect fit. And she already has experience manipulating reality. Oh, God. In touch. <laughs> Like, we need to run this through legal, but um, the shade, she already has experience manipulating reality. It says, quote, she created a whole farce, false narrative about herself as a Spanish aristocrat a couple of years ago, even faking a Spanish accent, um, though she was born and raised in Boston as Hillary Hayward Thomas, notes an insider, she's made for reality TV. Yikes. Sources say, Hilaria, Hillary. Like Hillary Haywood Thomas sounds like the names that Reese Witherspoon's Elle Woods was reading out when she was talking about all the bougie East Coast girls. She's like, I mean, I live in Hollywood, but all the like bougie East Coast girls that Warner should have married. Hillary Hayward Thomas sounds like the aristocratic East Coast name, but okay. Sources say Hillary is also excited about joining the Hollywood social scene. She loves being the center of attention. This is a win-win for her, especially if Alec winds up cooling his heels behind bars. So more than multiple nannies then. Yes, just like, just like Vivian Kensington. Chris, thank you. Um, also, th that, that, that would be some, that would be something. Um, but the Real Housewives does love a legal drama. And I think Erica would be like, yes, please. Someone else's legal drama is, uh, is going to take center stage. Can you imagine? When does Real Housewives of Beverly Hills start filming? It's gotta be soon. Let's get back to this legal filing. That's fascinating. Oh boy. We, uh, I think we're gonna just stay at audacity levels for, for the moment. We've learned so much today. The filing goes on to say, there is no law preventing Baldwin from using the national press to sway public opinion in the hope that he will escape criminal prosecution. He's a party, legal ethics don't apply to him. However, it hardly seems appropriate to complain in November, 2023, that the prosecutors in January 2023 made statements to the press that prejudiced him when he made false statements to the press intended to sway public opinion in December 2021 and August 2022. Your Honor, he talked to the press first. Defense counsel points to press conferences made by the previous prosecutors and flippant and joking email exchanges between the DA and the special prosecutor. It is important to review the supposed political motives defense counsel alleges were in play at the time of the email exchange. The email shows special prosecutor Reeb's intention was in fact to not announce that she was gonna be the special prosecutor, specifically assuring the DA that she would not disclose to any media personnel that she had been chosen special prosecutor. Then in a clear joking aside, she states, quote, at some point though, I'd at least like to get out there. I am assisting you as it might help my campaign lol the problem is it doesn't read as joking when it's put into emotion that goes both ways like the things 
that that just goes both ways. It goes both ways when Baldwin says it, it goes both ways when the DA says it. Uh, let's see. District attorney replied that it was her intent to announce the special prosecutor's appointment at some future date once the investigation was handed over to the DA's office nearly two months later and after the primary election was already over on August 3rd, the DA announced the appointment. I don't think they should have, I don't care about any of this. I don't think they should have announced the appointment of somebody who was actively in a campaign running for office. Even though it was after the primary, I, I I don't know why that choice was made. I don't think it was a good choice. They should have avoided that at the beginning. <sighs> they go on to talk, let's see, about all the back and forth with NBC, which we got in the last motion. Um... Oh, we're going to we're going to skim through this cuz we have a few other attachments that we want to get to. Let's see. Presenting the case to a grand jury rather than proceeding to a preliminary hearing provides two obvious benefits to Baldwin. First, Baldwin does not have to pay his attorneys to to premiere at a preliminary to appear at a preliminary hearing and would likely take approximately 2 weeks, a task that defense counsel indicated would cost Baldwin well into the six-figure range or more. Second of Second, all of the evidence against Baldwin, including several highly relevant videos from the filming of Rust, would not be presented publicly as it would during a preliminary hearing. <laughs> I think we saw some of them during the last trial, but I'm sure there are more. Out of fairness to Mr. Baldwin and in the spirit of ensuring that similarly situated defendants do not receive disparate treatment, Baldwin was offered the same plea deal previously offered to Halls. Um, let's see. And then, and then they find out about the talking to potential witnesses and then the offer is rescinded. We saw that in the last motion, the forensic testing. Oh my goodness. The portion of the October 17th article that pertained to the forensic testing of the gun and the conclusion that the trigger had to have been pulled for the gun to fire was previously released to the press and was subject of countless news articles when the ballistics report was released by Gutierrez's counsel, Mr. Bowles. The prosecution's like, we didn't do it. Not our fault. And then this is a just list of news articles that makes my eyes want to jump out of my brain. Mr. Bowles was, prov or, or face, or eye holes, or whatever. Um, Mr. Bowles was provided the report as it is exculpatory to Gutierrez and her reliance on the same defense of proximate cause that Baldwin relies upon. Gutierrez claims that the chain of proximate cause was broken by Baldwin pulling the trigger of the gun. Mm, not well. They they did not they did not argue that well at trial. Do you think they argued that well at trial? Am I being too critical of Gutierrez's defense? While Baldwin claims that the chain of proximate cause was broken by Gutierrez unknowingly placing a live bullet into the gun. Bowles avoided allegations of extrajudicial comments contrary to the rules by failing to, by filing a frivolous motion with the, wait, what? Um, by filing a frivolous motion with the court on August 15th and attaching the full forensic report as an exhibit. Judge Summer relieved the state of its obligation of filing a formal response to the motion because the issues raised in the motion were not ripe for consideration. Within hours of the filing of the motion, every major news outlet in the country had a full copy of the forensic report, yep, uh, that concluded that Baldwin had to have pulled the trigger for the gun to have discharged the live round. Yep. Yep, yep. Yep, yep, yep. Undersigned counsel referred to the report that had previously been made public by Bowles when she commented on the October 17th, 2023 article. The only reason there's an issue as to whether Baldwin pulled the trigger of the gun is because Baldwin appeared on a national primetime news network and claimed he did not pull the trigger. I think that's a fair assertion. Mm, the state is not responsible for the conduct of Mr. Baldwin or Mr. Gu or Ms. Gutierrez or their counsel. More into the model rules. What statements are allowed to be made, which we saw in the last motion. Let's see. This is the NBC News thing that we just saw recited. 
Mm. Undersigned counsel does not watch the Today Show. <laughs> Great. Or any other morning news program. She was completely unaware of the portion of the Today Show on November 16th that pertained to the case against Baldwin until receiving defense counsel's motion for sanctions. After finally locating a video of the Today Show portion related to Baldwin on YouTube, which appeared to be rebroadcast of the November 15th story, which aired on NBC Nightly News, she noticed that the one minute mark the story narrator stated, Baldwin's legal team and the special prosecutors declined to comment on the videos. Defense counsel had expressed, expressed concerns over the statements in both articles related to prior instances where Baldwin has run afoul of the law and assertions that prosecutors believe him to be arrogant and that the prosecution is simply an attempt at humbling Mr. Baldwin. Charges against Baldwin are not being pursued because of his criminal history, his impressive level of arrogance, or to teach him a lesson. Oh my God. <laughs> The prosecution is responding to the defense's argument that the prosecution is pursuing this prosecution because Baldwin is arrogant. And the prosecution's response is charges against Baldwin are not being pursued because of his criminal history, his impressive level of arrogance, or to teach him a lesson. <laughs> The D did not disappoint. Thank you, Exhibit D. The judge has to be like, fuck all of you. Stop it with the mudslinging. But for legal commentary on the internet. <laughs> um, This trial is going to be bananas. The sky has gotten very dark outside. I've been streaming for way too long. We're not done. We're still, we're, we're still here. Do I have any meetings today? Hold on. I don't think so. I think we're good. Either way, we're still going. Oh, we're fine. We'll be fine. State's counsel did not anticipate refiling charges against Baldwin after the no lay or no, no prosequi was filed. Counsel's intention was to complete the investigation and make a sound and reasonable charging decision in a case where human life was lost. The loss of human life necessitated that a full and detailed investigation be completed. That's fair. The evidence that came to light during the course of the investigation made clear that a probable cause determination must be formally made as inculpatory information has been discovered concerning Baldwin's conduct on the set of rust that is relevant to the charge of involuntary manslaughter. Out of fairness to Baldwin, counsel offered him a very generous plea, but was forced to rescind the plea due to Baldwin's actions. Um, Baldwin has failed to establish that he suffered any prejudice from limited statements made by the prosecutors in the press. Remember, this is the response to the motion for sanctions that doesn't seem to have a ruling yet at all. Um, counsel for the state requested they be able to ask limited number of questions to ensure the grand jury could be fair in this to the state and to the target, given the amount of press coverage, criminal investigation, uh, the press coverage of the incident, the investigation and the prosecution. Special prosecutors do not wish to present a case to a grand jury that cannot be fair to Baldwin. The court denied the request, noting that the grand jurors had already been counseled on the requirement that they are fair and impartial. Um, let's see. Mr. Baldwin has a history of using his fame and influence to access the media and defend his criminal conduct. This is the part that we were looking for when we started this. And what we ended up with was an impressive amount of arrogance, a pr impressive amount of arrogance. But this was the part that we were looking for. When I wanted to read Exhibit D, it was the outline of Baldwin's, mm -hmm. they say, uh, bad acts. In 2018, Baldwin allegedly punched a man in the face for taking his parking spot. After the incident, Baldwin appeared on the Ellen DeGeneres show and claimed that the victim had tried to run over his wife, Hilaria. Baldwin was sued by the victim and in turn filed a countersuit against the victim for defamation, claiming that he pushed the victim and did not punch him in the face. Baldwin's litigation team included a signed affirmation from defense counsel asserting that the video of the incident absolved Baldwin of wrongdoing. 
In the end, Baldwin entered a guilty plea to harassment and settled civilly with the victim, according to page six. Mr. Baldwin, it says, has a long history of engaging in aggressive, inappropriate, and or criminal conduct and then using the press or social media to sway public opinion. For example, in 2007, there was a great deal of press coverage over rude comments he made to his daughter. I remember well. He responded on his professional website that his conduct was actually the fault of his ex-wife subjecting him to parental alienation. He did call his daughter a selfish little pig. She was like 10. Oh, I remember this. In 2011, Baldwin was kicked off an American Airlines flight for refusing to turn his phone off. He was playing words with friends. I remember, I remember that quite well. In response, Baldwin posted on social media and agreed to an interview with the Huffington Post where he blamed the flight attendant for singling him out. He thought he would be able to keep playing words with friends. In 2012, he was accused of physically assaulting a photographer in New York. Baldwin responded by having a representative conduct an interview with People Magazine and posting on social media that the paparazzi, paparazzi should be waterboarded. In 2013, Baldwin was criticized for using a homophobic slur. Please don't include that in the filing. Okay, good. I was looking through the filing quickly. This is the problem with first uh, looks. Is you never know what they're going to put in here. One that he continued to use in the video clips from the filming of Rust. Oh, dear. His response was to deny the use of the slur and then post on MSNBC's website apologizing for the use of the slur. In 2014, Baldwin was arrested for failing to produce his identification after being stopped for a violation while riding his bicycle. Did he look at them and go, don't you know who I am? Why do I need identification? I'm curious. In response, Baldwin posted on Twitter and blamed the police officer. Baldwin's conduct in all of the instances outlined above has absolutely nothing to do with the current case. Well, at least we're clear on that. Involving the death of Ms. Hutchins. However, what Mr. Baldwin is doing in the current case by using the press and blaming others, even blaming others for using the press, is par for the course with him. And he has even been aided in the past by defense counsel. While all of the press contacts and coverage in this case are new to New Mexico prosecutors and courts, they are not new to Mr. Baldwin. This is what he does. He deflects the negative attention that his conduct invites by turning the focus on others by using the press. Undersigned counsel would gladly enter into a full gag order on all things pertaining to Mr. Baldwin and the criminal charges being proposed against him. Based on Baldwin's history of constantly using the news media and social media to his own benefit, it's highly unlikely that he or his attorneys would agree to anything that would limit their ability to use the press for their own benefit. So it appears the status quo will continue. The prosecution's like, I would love for them to shut up. I will happily shut up if they will also shut up. As to the motion to remove and or sanction the prosecutor, the special prosecutors, the state sees zero allegations in the motion that even allege any misconduct by Lewis. It is asinine, Jesus, that the target even included Lewis's name in the motion given the target cannot and does not point to a single instance of alleged misconduct by Mr. Lewis. The target's counsel should be sanctioned for filing the frivolous motion against Mr. Lewis. Conclusion. Um, deny us to us and sanction them. States Exhibit E. Uh, this is the no low prosequi. I covered it when it was filed. They dropped charges. It very clearly says the case is dismissed without prejudice. The investigation is active and ongoing. States Exhibit F. Instructions to the grand jury. We're not going to go through all the instructions to the grand jury. Um, I imagine that the prosecution has recited them properly, but this is the entirety of the handout. Um, I'm going to try to zoom through that because I imagine it's, oh, it's actually not that long. It's only a few pages. Great. States Exhibit G. Reply to target's response to state's opposed expedited motion for scheduling order establishing deadline for Bort Jones letter and hearing. We've already been through this litigation. We're not doing it again today. Um, this is with regard to the 
the letter and what can be used in the letter. We went through all of that in the defense motion. We don't need to get into it anymore. Um, let's see what else. These are emails back and forth regarding the discovery and the records requests. Great. States Exhibit H is a certification of service. Notice of peremptory excusal of judge. Oh, this is the, the paper of the judge from February 5th, uh, 2024. Defendant Baldwin notifies the court that they're papering the judge um, under Rule 5-106, and that was served. Exhibit I. I'm glad we have the same judge. The same, the judge, the judge knows. Uh, these are the SAG safety bulletins, which I imagine are voluminous. So I'm going to zoom, zoom through those, but they are attached. Um, it is voluminous. It's quite a lot of pages. That's why this thing is 300 pages long. States Exhibit J is all of the background of HAG, um, which is extensive. Like it, this this cv is so so extensive and just i i there's it's so much um it's just it's a it's a, there's no end to this resume these are all of the different productions and we're we're it, it, a tr just a tremendous amount of experience for Mr. Hag, but we need to get to the videos that Runkle sent. Let's see. Exhibit, wait, where'd we go? Exhibit K is Michael Hag, the son, and his resume, which is also fairly extensive. Ah, the call sheet. Exhibit L. Here is the call sheet. Yay, we got to the call sheet. Um, general crew call, shooting call, and this lists who the production company is. Director Joel Souza, producer Alec Baldwin, then the executive producers, then the other producers, then the co-producer, then the ADs, second ADs, the weather. Um, no forced calls, meal penalties, or overtime without prior approval of the line producer. And then it runs through, <clears throat> excuse me, runs through the day. This is the call sheet. She this is the call sheet for the day of the shooting. Um, and it talks about what they are going to be doing that day with the horses, with the weapons, and with the rest of it. This is the afternoon, it looks like call sheet. Um Let's see. These are the producers. Anyway, nope. This starts with 6 a.m. So this is, I guess, the more, the more detailed call sheet. It's not all very easy to read, but these are the call sheets. And then there is a Dropbox for the rest of the exhibits. And with that, we are going to go to the videos that uh, my friend Ian Runkle sent because he had them. So let me try to pull those up so we can see them. Let me, which means I'm going to have to change around which screen we're sharing, which is fine. Uh, let's see. Wait, these are the videos. Oh, can I get these onto the computer? I don't know if I can. Let me see if I can get them onto the computer. I don't know if I can. Ah! I think Uncle saved them. And I don't know if I can pull them up on... The computer. Hmm. Let's see if I can. Oh, yes, I can airdrop them. All right, we'll do that. Oh, no, wait, I can't do that. I will let me get these off of my phone onto my computer quickly, and then we'll go from there. So give me one second because I need to just text them to myself to get them onto the computer. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, it's just going to take me a second. Because that this is going to be much easier than trying to grab the Dropbox link, which is I'm assuming where Ian got them from, because uh, that Dropbox link wasn't pulling up directly in my um, 
in my, let's see, did this pull up? Uh, in, where are they? The Dropbox link didn't pull up well in my, um, there we go. Oh, what was I saying? In my PDF, Lord, Lord almighty. So I'm going to try to pull up the other one. These are just going to go to my desktop and then we'll look at them. But this trial is going to be bananas. And then we're going to go to Q and a, so give me one minute while the other video populates and then we'll go to Q and a today is going to be, um, well, today is a longer stream than anticipated. There was the other video. Fantastic. Don't worry. We're going to go video by video. Um, as as we do so here's the first one mm -mm -mm -mm. wait share screen why is the stop camera button and the share screen button too close to <laughs> too close together all right hopefully we have the audio full up this is showing the church on the set of rust let's take a look at this nine second clip um Yikes. <laughs> um, so what it said in the filing was that these were during the, um, the weapons training. This is not weapons training. He does very clearly say, my fucking hat came off. Let's do it again. It, it doesn't s seem that um, this is what one should be doing with their spare time. Why is he shooting blanks at individuals recording him for social media? <sighs> with just no target in mind no it seems to be no consideration in mind and uh, and is hannah the one filming this because there's a giggle at the end when he said my fucking hat came off let's do it again so i imagine hannah is the one recording this video again this looks like a beautiful set that could have been a beautiful movie but this is wild I bet this isn't on the call sheet. Let's do it again. Jeez. Yeah, I'm not surprised the dude in the khaki pants starts backing up. I would back up too. Lord almighty. That. All right, let's pull up the other one. Um, so the prosecution is saying that during the time Baldwin should have been doing his weapons training, he wanted to record videos for his family and or for social media. So let's, um, all right, let's take a look at this other one. There we go. All right, let's take a look at this. This is a vertical video, 10 seconds long. The wind is uh is getting it. Oh no. That doesn't seem like weapons uh safety training to me. Yikes. So when the prosecution is dialing down that their theory is going to be the negligent handling of a firearm, you're going to be able to see that theory develop that Baldwin was not taking the firearms seriously and that this is the negligent handling of a firearm. And I 
I can see how they get there. They have to acknowledge, and it seems in their recent filings, they have acknowledged that, well, let's do a quick summary. We're at like four hours. Let's do, let's do a summary. Let's get to questions, but let me, I need to move my screen around. It's bugging the, ah, <laughs> my screen is fighting with me and I don't know why. Uh, but my screen is fighting with me. I'm trying to reset it so I can see your questions uh, better and not look at the side screen and look at the camera, but it's fighting me today. It's like, girl, we're done. Somebody put mercury in the microwave. There was an eclipse. And now what's not going to happen is tech working. So now I have to fight with it. Oh, there we go. It's probably user error. Let's be honest. All right. Let's, let's do a quick summary on this. There. <sighs> There is clearly no love lost between the prosecution team and Baldwin's defense team because the amount of shade that was thrown in these motions was substantial. The amount of legal arguing at the end of the motions was just a handful of pages. Most of the motion was taken up throwing shade back at Baldwin's attorneys after they came after the prosecutors and basically reiterated their entire motion for sanctions in their filing to dismiss the indictment. Prosecutors pointed out that when Baldwin's lawyers claimed that the prosecution never told the grand jury that they could ask for witnesses, the prosecution says that that was defense counsel's ignorance of the law and that, in fact, the judge instructs the grand jury thoroughly what their duties are and hands them out a packet that is attached on what their duties are, what they can and cannot ask for, and that they can always refer back to the judge to guide them on what evidence they can ask for and receive. Additionally, the prosecution made clear that they not only read out Alec Baldwin's full uh, target response letter to the grand jury, but had banker's boxes full of the documents that Baldwin wanted shown to the jury available for them and the grand jury was told that all of those documents were available to them as they went back to deliberate so if they wanted to review them each of them could have taken a copy and reviewed them and they chose not to which is legally permissible it's interesting to me that the defense clearly left that out when they were alleging the prosecution made nothing available that they were supposed to we also learned that the prosecution chose to rescind the plea offer upon learning that Baldwin, as they allege in their filings, was seeking to make a documentary about the shooting on the set of Rust and was pressuring key witnesses to the criminal case to be interviewed for that documentary. Throughout the rest of the filings that we reviewed today, we also saw that Baldwin and his wife maybe were pitching a reality show about their family and that Baldwin's wife would like to be another cast member on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. It was a very interesting day of pleadings, a lot of shade. And when we get to the hearings in this case, it is going to be fiery. No ruling is made yet on that motion for sanctions. No ruling has been made yet on this motion to dismiss the indictment. The defense has not filed their reply yet. Hopefully it's not 300 pages, but when the reply is filed, we'll cover it. And I look forward to seeing how this hearing goes down. You know, I'll be covering it. All right, let's get to your questions. Y'all, four hours in, Emily, we're just covering one topic today. It's gonna be fine. It's gonna be fine. No, it's not. I also don't love the way I look with a green background. I don't. I don't love it. I don't love it. Can we do like fireplace vibes? Let's do that. I just, I can't. I can't. We're at the end of the day. <sighs> that, uh, that was a lot. Yeah, Miguelina, let's go ahead and end the poll about do you think Baldwin will testify uh, that I put up two hours ago. <laughs> Almost 10,000 of you voted. Thank you for that. Also, we are um, not very far away. We're less than like 200 votes away from 700 or 200 votes. 200 subs away from, um, if I do that math correctly, from 750,000. Maybe I can be persuaded to put up a little bit of a sub counter on the, uh, on the, 
on the screen and show you guys where we're at. But with over, you know, 10,000 of you in here, I think we can do that. Um, so let's get to some of your questions and super chats. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. M says it's as close as we get to a green screen. True. Uh, Paul, do you think Alec Baldwin will testify? 71% yes, 28% no. I, I think Alec Baldwin will want to testify whether his lawyers will let her do it. Um, depends, really does depend. All right, let's get to some of your questions and super chats. The best uh, that we can. Colin says, and Emily is never late, nor is she early. She arrives precisely when she means to. I mean, time is a construct and ADHD is a struggle. So yes, sometimes, sometimes. Uh, let's see. Oh, Saint in the chat said, where is it? Um, oh, Saint said, EDB, no tornado warnings yet on Ryan Hall, y'all. So we're not quite in scheduling conflict territory yet. I know we've got some weather coming through, like I can see it, but I don't think we are, we are not warned. Um, we are not even noticed at the moment. So I think we're good for, for the moment. Um, it's just a matter of me having things I have to figure at the end of the day. Um, Angela said, trigger warning, law and lumber went over it and it's awful. Angela, I'm sorry that I forgot what this was regarding. It's probably regarding P. Diddy's son's lawsuit. That's tomorrow's podcast. I did not go into every detail of every allegation so that we could still cover the legal side without being uh, uh, too in depth, but it is difficult. I read through all of it uh and it is difficult smurf anna said not me going back to edb ted talk today because i needed it today and getting an ad for amica insurance <laughs> smurf anna the way that that is too perfect lonard y'all lonard megapine uh and those are the the emojis they don't always translate into the super chats but thank you that's really funny that is on the tedx channel so i have no control really over that fiona gifted five memberships thank you so much um mia Moo said why doesn't edb have a million subscribers yet question what picture is your hoodie it reminds me of the 90s the hoodie is um is grogu and it reminds me of the 90s too why don't we have a million subs yet not everybody knows what we do here yet so it's much easier i think to grow subs on on quick content it takes a a highly intelligent individual to be like, ah, oh, I would like to have discussions about the law and that's why the law nerds are here. But I'm okay, truly with that because it is kind of a lovely joke between me and Griffin. Mike said, did Dr. B threaten to use your sink if, if you didn't go? No, but he should have. He should have just been like, I'm gonna start using your sink. Go get your teeth cleaned. It hasn't been that long, but long enough that he's like, ma'am, um, you said you were gonna reschedule and you never did. Though there's times I say I'm going to reschedule and like a year and a half later, I'm like, oh yeah, sorry. Melanie said, my husband stepped away for a few minutes. I told him he hasn't missed anything. He said, I know she probably hasn't started the intro yet. True. It took me 20 minutes today. We had lots to chat about. Humanoid Dragon said, fun fact, Phil Spector was suspected in my friend's disappearance in the late 90s. I'm humanoid design. I'm sorry to hear that. It, it took really the filming and catching him on audio to uh for that prosecution to go forward so i am sorry about that linsa daughter uh was in band from eighth grade on drum major junior and senior year that's amazing marching southerners four years south winds drum bugle two years plays nine instruments um main and tenor sax that's incredible and i found the musically inclined folks that i was in band with i was in guard also can play multiple instruments. It's an, an incredible skill. I, um, not so much. Is the proof in the room with us, Poot? <laughs> Is it here? Have we missed it? Tonk said, can anything bad happen to the dog as a result of the LR trial? I think we mean Karen Reed. I don't think so. Um, I don't, see why there would be um but we're gonna have to go through the trial and then ask again 
Nicole said, so what you are saying, Emily, is that I will be in gavel to gavel trial with you as I study for finals and multiple essays and research papers. Good to know. Yes, we're going to. Amber says 14 months. Wow. Feels like we're besties. We are the Lawnards. The Lawnards are a bestie type community. Maggie says, EDB, have you considered Lawnard or EDB air luggage tags? I would rock that. Yes, it's finding distributors with all things and then prioritizing time. We have stuff that we are finishing up in the app that has taken priority, but yes. Um, Aerie said, picturing Fred and George in airline uniforms. Oh my God, they would be so good, except they they would just like decide whose lap they would lay on. You might arrive at your destination with hair. Angela said, the fox in socks defense. Ugh. Um, Mart Zuli said, my life is not complete without EDB. Well, thank you. I'm I'm here to hopefully make things a little bit better. Um, Chelsea Rama said, love your gavel to gavel coverage. I know it's a sacrifice for you and team Baker, family Baker. So thank you. I love it too, but it's also why we don't do every single trial because I have a hard time doing parts of trials, which is why if we're ever jumping into a part of a trial like Shabusiness, we'll jump in the, the defense part. Same with, um, same with Brooks, we'll jump in at the defense part. So we're jumping in after the prosecution's done their case with some understanding that it takes time uh, for sure. Diamond Hatchet said EDB off topic, um, but thought of you when 50 Cent shaded Diddy at Dreamland Fest in North Carolina. That man cannot help himself. He definitely has all the thoughts. Like Fiddy has all of the thoughts. Pulling up Ian breaking Rob while waiting. Pull up Ian. I don't, I don't know what happened. Um, late, but I had shingles when I was 24. One of the worst experiences of my life. I hate needles, but that vaccine is so worth it. I, I have heard, I, not a personal experience, but I have heard. Kate said EDB streams are the best vibe for getting ready, traveling to work night shift at my hospital. Nothing better for this RN. Well, thank you. We have lots of RN and shift workers in the chat, and I appreciate all of you for the work that you do. Kate said, wait just a second. This is a 300 page response to the motion to dismiss. Are they just trying to bury each other in paperwork? Yes. And all the rest of us. And all the rest of us. Jason Heath said, I highly recommend Zelda and Chill. That sounds amazing. Um, Kate says, living for the prosecution's level of petty. Like everybody's gone to petty town. They've all stolen Swoop's tagline. They've all gone to petty university. Everyone just wants to be Swoop. They can't be. They're not nearly as fabulous, but they are trying to take it to petty university. <laughs> and, um, and, and today it was well appreciated. Look, sometimes the cases we cover are challenging. Sometimes they are hilarious. Sometimes they are both. And the 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 mudslinging is just going both ways and the, the the gloves are off like it's just here we are aaron said didn't realize my anniversary for the chat for two years until i sent it time flies you're such a huge inspo to this adhd learner thank you um maddie says so happy to catch you to be live on my birthday and while i prep for a job interview today wish you wish me luck good luck love being part of the law nerd community we have lots to celebrate here is to here today Ice Cream Sunday said, please remember all, it's Helena, not Helena, um, spelled with the Y, not uh, in the in the um, E-N-A formation. Um, Susie Q said, Alec will not want to have the last, will want to have the last word. He just strikes me as that type of person, kind of like Murdoch. Mm -hmm. Stina said, his ego won't let him stay quiet at trial. Even if he intends to not testify, the prosecution may, might poke at him enough that he feels that he has to. Gringo says a lot of time has passed. I think he'll follow his attorney's instructions during trial. One would hope. Medicated moment says, sure hate it when I'm depressed when cocking. <laughs> Same. Sometimes it helps though. Um, if that's your jam. Apple Jam and PB says defense. We would be forced to subpoena Helen Mirren and Harrison Ford prosecution. Oh my God, promise. <laughs> yeah, bet. <laughs> Destiny said, funky panic at the disco bass guitar starts. All right, all right. It's a hell of a feeling though. I mean, come on. Judy, you got this as I volunteer as tribute to call Jensen. Everyone in the chat is with you, Judy. The Chuggy Show Live says some people don't understand what the title of producers can mean in the film industry. Some are responsible for pre and post production. Some are on set producers. There are degrees of culpability. And I think they're going to have to break that down. But I think they're I think the prosecution's strongest case 
is really that he pulled the trigger with a cocked gun and that is negligent use of a firearm. And if someone dies while well, you are negligently using a firearm, then you're at your involuntary manslaughter. The Chugi Show continued to say it would be like holding the CEO of Walmart, Walmart responsible for a death at my local Walmart, Baldwin having the credit. It really doesn't mean much. They're probably more financial, right? Um, Kate said, question, is the same judge trying Baldwin from the Gutierrez case? Yes, now. Julie Pixler said, EDB side note, I tried to email you an Emily appreciation note. Thank you. Um, and the email from your website bounced back. It should be the CESD one that's in my social media handles. But Miguelina, can we make a note just to double check uh, that it's been updated to make sure it's the CESD one? Kayla said, did the FBI use a velvet hammer to beat off the cock notch? No, it was a, it was not velvet. <laughs> it was, it was, um, they said what it was and I've completely forgot the chat will remember, but they said what it was. Um, and I completely forgot the type of mallet, but they said rawhide. Thank you. That's worse. <laughs> it was a rawhide mallet that they used to beat off the cock notch. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Rawhide. Uh, Lori, Lori Stacks, <laughs> I'm trying to move on so it does not become a full after dark. Gifted five memberships. Thank you so much, Lori. Uh, and Lori Zeppelina said, question, EDB, do you often get told by another attorney that they're going to destroy you? Oh my God. Travis, do you need help getting in? Is the door not opening? My son just came to my window and like waved at me. Hold on. Let me, um, let me make sure that the door opens for him real quick. We're going to. We're going to bop along to a funky music bed while I try to let him into the door. Give me 30 seconds. I wonder if the door is stuck. Should I get up and go do it? I mean, maybe. And I'm going to try to just unlock it from here because I can. So hopefully that works. If it doesn't, I'll go get it. It says it's unlocked. So hopefully he is in. We'll give it a minute. Um, it sounds like he got in. Okay. So question, did you often get told by another attorney they were going to destroy you? It seems like that attorney told the defense told the reporter from NBC and the reporter from NBC told the prosecution, the prosecution's like, uh, yeah, and what's next? Um, but no, I had a very collegial uh, relationship with most of the attorneys I worked with. And if that ever happened in a context, it would be in like a joking context. It wouldn't be in like a, oh my God, I'm going to destroy you. There were definitely attorneys I didn't get along with, but we didn't generally make it personal. Um, nobody ever, well, I don't know if I can say that. Um, I, I had less threats of being punched than some of my colleagues did. Uh, but there are definitely times emotions can run high. Angela, thank you for the gifted memberships. I appreciate it. Um, let's see. Did you understand how hard it is for him EDB? Don't you understand how hard it is for him? No, I don't. Um, Tasha said reality show equals private life. <laughs> I just want a reality show. Oh, Vicky said, tell Dr. B there is a second sing shingle shot. He knows. Emily Outdoors says, serious question. Can a judge ever reprimand the lawyers for being too snarky in their filings? Yes. This judge might threaten to take away their coffee, but can say the filings have taken a turn too personal and unprofessional. Let's not do that. Yes, I can. I wish I'd run into Dave living in Charlottesville. I mean, all of us. Miss Mandy reacts said what you do encourage me to start a YouTube channel. Thank you. You're welcome. And congratulations. It's exciting. I love getting to have a chat with all of you on this platform. It's great. Ice Ice Baby. Good to see you. Can we get a rubric for huge egos and have a battle between Murdoch and Baldwin? Finish him. Uh, we're going to have to see what Baldwin does at trial. And then I think we're going to have to circle back and do it. I think so. Um, also, all of you in the chat that are asking, EDB Air only has first class. The entire plane is first class. Um, the lighting scheme is kind of a la Virgin Airlines with the purple. Um, lots of snacks and drinks, lots of hydration, but it is all first class. All of the seats are first class. So it's 
it's good. Um, Jennifer celebrating one year as a Law Nerd member. Congratulations. When he said Ian's TikTok has a Janet lawsuit video short, it breaks Rob. It's perfection. I will, I will go look. I don't have um a TikTok account. I'm sure it's a YouTube short on his channel. I'll go look too. Cindy, why I'm sorry that I missed these. Thank you for the gift of memberships. Bob it, thank you for the gift of memberships. Uh, Michelle V said good morning from Long Beach. I have iced coffee this morning. I love Long Beach. It's been too long since I've been back. Um, let's take a look real quick where we're at with the live sub counter. I said that I would, and then we we're going to take a break, uh, because tomorrow is a very busy day. We have court tomorrow. If you do not have the, um, this is the wrong window. If you do not have the Law Nerd app, you are going to need the Law Nerd app in the coming weeks as we get into all things trial, all things, um, Karen Reed. Why won't this? Let's see. This page will not show. Give me one second. We've got to re rearrange the windows. There are too many open and my computer is like, girl, what are we doing? But we will just add this real quick. You're going to need the Law Nerd app to follow all the court coverage that is coming up in the next uh, couple days because there is a substantial amount of court. There are going to be some unusual stream days and so that is something we are going to have to deal with. So there we are. We are at 4, 749, 827. <clears throat> For those of you that are not yet subscribed, Lawnards, questions, any opinions regarding the Wisconsin stabbing? I'm confused since he was in fight or flight response and therefore it's self-defense, therefore he shouldn't be on trial. I have not watched any of that case. I don't know the facts of that case. I will say that self-defense is just that. It is a defense, and this is a broad generality. Self-defense is a defense. And when you're looking at self-defense as a defense, um, you have to keep in mind that a defense needs to be proven. So prosecutors can go forward on cases that have claims of self-defense and, and make the defendant prove the self-defense to a jury. That can happen, but I don't, um, I don't follow it. Uh, let's see. UTC time for members only live. Um, I'm sure one of the mods can pop it in. We had to reset the time for the members only live. And I don't remember off, uh, the top of my head. So, um, first class is the only way to fly too bad. It's so darn expensive. Look, EDB air is going to be all first class, just first class only. It's fine. Uh, does it count if I unsub them resub? No, it does not. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is not how that works. Um, but we get a discount on EDB air. Exactly. We are close. Do not worry. But if we do not make it today, it is okay. Um, what is the latest you made it? Mom goal, your kiddo was set for your subs. Oh, once we get to a million, I'm sure he's going to change the, the bar. So that's just, that's just Griffin. He's going to just be like, mm. <laughs> let's see. Um, Michelle said, Peter at lawyer, you know, is recapping the Apple River trial. And Peter's a great, uh, a great commentary, a commentator, great lawyer. Uh, if others are covering it, I do not know. I have not paid attention. I have, I feel like I have been run over by the amount of filings of stuff I want to cover. And I didn't want to pop into another trial right before we got into five, six weeks of the read trial. I, I, there, we, I would be so far behind. I would feel anxious. And I didn't want to feel all the anxiety. Um, Chenzi says, wait, the judge can take away coffee. The judge said it during the Gutierrez trial and was like, I let you have coffee. Don't make me take away your coffee. So the judge had originally said that the rules of the courtroom were water only and then allowed the lawyer to have, um, to have coffee and then changed it. How did you do in the excuse me, Pokemon sleep Raikou event. I got three Raikou. I mean, I think they're okay. I didn't really look to see, but, um, you guys, this is where we're at. Let's see if we bing tomorrow. We're, or later today, we're going to be, um, in court tomorrow. Don't forget. We don't normally stream on Wednesday, but we will be. Tina KS Lawnard said, uh, gifted 10 memberships. Thank you, Tina. I appreciate it. Tracy, thank you for the 10 memberships. I appreciate it. Uh, so with all of that, I will be streaming tomorrow because there is a hearing in Idaho with the expert from the questions that we saw at the last hearing. Let's see what the expert has to say. We'll see what judge judge does. Judge judge seems 
pretty pissed about the entire thing and that'll be interesting. We also have a members only and a premiere of the podcast covering Alec, uh, not Alec Baldwin, good Lord, P. Diddy's son and P. Diddy being sued in another lawsuit, plus the court's complaints about plaintiff's counsel and how UMG is leveraging that in their case to a hearing uh, earlier today. So with all of that, I will talk to you soon. Don't forget to download the Lawnard app. Lawnards, you are the best community on the internet, hands down. And I will see all of you tomorrow. All right, friends. Bye. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering and fast notifications on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search the app store for Lawnerd. You can also follow me around social media. And don't forget to check out my podcast, The Emily Show, with quick bits dropping every Monday, summarizing everything I do here on the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday for when you just have time for the quick bits. Thanks for being a Lawnerd. Nerd.